and i'm there only on um, reaching on friday evening and i think by the time i come your uh, that special cultural evening would be nearly over yeah are so, we live uh, fellow oh, no it will not be over i think it's just we are in live yeah we are live yeah a uh, very good evening to one and all of you for our uh, i edu webinar and this time as we all know we are going to be uh, dealing with uh, pediatric retinal disorders and the clinical pearls which come with it and i am truly uh, myself and dr arshi are truly indebted to all of you for bringing that extra richness to our webinars by your very presence here today and i'm sure the next 2 and a half hours is going to be a very enriching experience for us and for all of those who are going to be hearing us over the next few days we are truly lucky uh, dr mahesh anbugam to have you prestigious presence here today and we all know he heads the vitreo retina services and ocular oncology services of uh, shankara uh, eye hospital uh, bangalore a very warm welcome dr mahesh and dr subhadra jalali uh, would be joining us soon and i know she'll do more than uh, uh, justice to her uh, time spent with us and we all know that she is a senior consultant of the vitreo retina services and the network director and quality director and director of the new eye health alliance at lvpi and i'm sure we're going to learn so much from this very dynamic lady we are so lucky to have with us dr gopal lingam words would be not enough to express our gratitude doctor he i was actually even wondering whether since the talk should not get repetitive but we had to tell him that how could ever any talk of dr gopal become repetitive it's going to be new and unique for all of us and he is a senior professor of shankar netralaya medical research foundation chennai also an associate professor of the national university of singapore senior investigator of singapore eye research institute and uh, thank you so much dr gopal and uh, we are always always you know enriched and rich getting richer by the day having dr mulidhar who not only heads the retina institute of karnataka but he is also a part of our uh, eye education and and uh, a very essential uh, hero of our uh, eye foundation group of hospitals and with his kind of experience and knowledge and he being one of the senior most retina specialist of karnataka with all the accolades and awards by him i'm so thankful to you dr mulidhar i'm sure you'll add great wisdom to this uh, two and a half hours moderating with me is this young hero ashay naika who is actually the essence and the the core of this meeting because i just told him ashay let's uh, this time it's for the retina meeting for i do and he was back with something so interesting and good and i'm sure all of you know he's a dynamic consultant vitreo retina consultant of the i foundation group of hospitals based at coimbatore and is a is a great uh, value and as a pearl and Every, a diamond for us so on to you uh, we shall be going on with our first speaker dr rajni batush and uh, she is a uh, uh, co-founder and uh, chief medical officer of the i stem research private uh, limited bangalore and uh, i mean she is an amazing person to uh, have amongst us today and with her accolades and awards the thing which is so much valuable is that she has uh, done a fellowship in inherited retinal dystrophism and has also been awarded a phd um, from ashish university on inherited retinal diseases so who else could we have than her for this very interesting talk on case based approaches using multimodal imaging in inherited retinal disorders so we look forward to next 8 minutes from you dr rajni uh vel murgan will uh, inform you at 17 minutes that you have 1 minute uh, there waiting okay on to thank you so much ma'am thank you for that kind introduction and i'm going to share my screen is the uh, screen visible yes okay <clears throat> so uh pediatric retinal dystrophy is a major cause of progressive vision loss in children and while we still talk about not having any you know specific treatment for most of these you know i think it's important that we have a timely visual rehabilitation and a genetic diagnosis and so this becomes a very important group of you know diseases so uh, when do we suspect this you know when a when a parent comes to us saying the child is not seeing well or the child is unable to you know fixate well or 
you know, you ask for history, the child is bumping into objects, child has severe photophobia, difficulty with night vision, nystag nystagmus. And the most important is uh, a drop in scholastic performance or a child struggling, you know, to do well in school is a very important pointer to understand if the child has, you know, a, a major retinal problem. So I'm going to start off with, you know, just a few cases, uh, uh, you know, uh, in this. Uh, the first is uh, uh, two sisters of a consanguineous marriage. The older child is a very, uh, you know, shy eight-year-old, had an episode of fever following which she was saying she couldn't, you know, see and she didn't want to go to school. Two examinations had been done, uh, which showed a vision of 618, but everything else reported normal. So... You know, uh, uh, the current examination, her vision was 624 in each eye with a normal anterior segment, and that was a fundus. So there was this little mottling of the macula that's just an overexposed disc, otherwise the you know uh, disc was normal. So uh, a routine fundus examination would have shown that this is completely normal. So what is important is, you know, that, that's an infrared image, which again is, you know, normal except for, I think for trained eyes, it's easy to pick that there's something not okay at the macula. But especially when, you know, there are smaller children and uh, children are not very cooperative, it's easy to say either the child is not cooperative or, you know, the, the fundus is normal. So you do a fundus autofluorescence and you figure out that there is something really not okay at the, you know, macula. So there is this uh, significant loss of autofluorescence at both the macula. And that's the OCT images of, you know, both the eyes. So there is this widespread loss of the outer retinal layers of the, you know, um, uh, photoreceptor layers in both the eyes. And so uh, her, while her full field ERG was normal. Now, what was the diagnosis? There was a, a question of whether this is an autoimmune retinopathy given the diffuse loss of photoreceptors. Is this the retinal dystrophy? Is this, you know, malingering? In fact, this child had been advised, you know, to be consulted, you know, for a, a psychiatric consult. So this child indeed has Stargardt disease, early onset Stargardt disease. And uh, uh, she did carry uh, two mutations in the ABCA4 uh, gene, which proved that this is indeed Stargardt disease. And so the take home message is, you know, imaging is a must in any child who presents to us with an unexplained vision loss or symptoms that are out of proportion to what we think is the fundus you know, uh, examination. So her sister, five-year-old, you know, very cheerful child, absolutely no complaints. In fact, the parents were a little hesitant, you know, to even get the child examined, saying the child is completely normal, doctor. We're not really sure whether the child, you know, examination is required, but they eventually agreed. And the child's visual acuity was, you know, six, nine, both eyes with a normal anterior segment. And actually the fundus appears normal. There is a bit of hypoautofluorescence at the macula, but some not something that we would worry and say, oh, there's something going on there. But when you do an OCT, you see this significant thickening of the X-limiting membrane and the uh, uh, photoreceptor layer. Now, this is very classical of very, very early onset Stargardt disease. So that's a close-up picture. So this child also, you know, indeed uh, did have uh, two mutations in the ABCA4 gene. So the, the spectrum of the disease itself, you know, typically Stargardt is, you know, what we see at about 11, 12, 13 years of age. So this is, there's another group that presents very early on between seven and nine. And while they have abnormal, you know, autofluorescence, what is very characteristic is the very, very diffuse loss of photoreceptors almost through the entire macula. And the ELM in Stargardt is a very distinct entity. So unless you, you know, uh, we do an OCT, this would not have got picked. So image, you know, uh, uh, siblings of children with any retinal dystrophy, because an early onset Stargardt may show a completely normal fundus. This is yet another child with, uh, you know, a six-year-old who was being treated by the neurologist for infantile spasm since the age of eight months uh, and epilepsy. So there was some developmental delay. The parents were very keen on a second child, and so they had got a whole exome sequencing done. So the whole exome sequencing had not unearthed uh, uh, any, uh, you know, major uh, uh, genetic uh, mutations. So uh, the parents were told that, you know, this is probably not genetic and they could, you know, uh, uh, have a second child without a problem. Now, the child was referred for routine eye examination by the pediatric neurologist. So when I insisted, the parents did say that the child may have had some vision problems, but because of all the troubles that, you know, the child was continuing to face, they probably had not given it much importance. The child's best vision was 636 with a normal anterior segment. And the that's the fundus. 
Again, a trained eye will say that there is a definite problem at the macula. And lo and behold, the autofluorescence will show the changes. And so is a photoreceptors. So see how significant loss of photoreceptors throughout the entire macula. So, uh, uh, so now in view of the new findings, we decided to reanalyze the same sample. And lo and behold, we not only found two mutations in ABCA4, but we also found a mutation that explains the child's um, you know, sy uh, systemic problem, which was an autosomal dominant one, while the parents didn't have, uh, you know, uh, any of this. This is probably something that had happened, you know, um, uh, uh, in the child alone. So, uh, you know, we had to counsel the child, you know, and so on. The child uh, uh, eventually saw a clinical geneticist, you know, for them to take this forward. And so a complete phenotype is a must. So I've had several discussions with the, you know, geneticists also asking, why was this not picked up in the, you know, first um, exome sequencing? Because the parents were very, very upset that, you know, an initial examination result had been given as normal. And so their whole question was, what if I had gone had another child and the child, you know, had ended up with the same problem? So, uh, you know, even for these mutations to, sort of to be identified, a complete phenotype is mandatory. So this is two more sisters. Um, born out of a consanguineous marriage this time. The older child was seen at, you know, a very young age. They're now much older, 17 and 13 years old. That presented with, you know, um, the very classical features of vision loss early on. And that was a fundus, I think, when the child was about five or six. And this is a child's uh, fundus images today. She's about 17. She wants to do medicine and uh, uh, normal appearing fundus, except probably for the mottling, if you're going to look for it. So, the OCT shows that the outer retina is more or less well preserved. While it's not a very healthy photosystem layer, this is not classically what you would see as a diffuse loss if that we saw in the you know, other conditions. That's the right eye and that's the left eye. And uh, significant field loss in both the eyes. And this was an ERG that had been done much earlier, showing a significant loss of both rods and cones in both eyes. So her sister, her vision is, you know, much worse. She's about 660 both eyes. And again, you know, near normal looking fundi. And we repeat, you know, the OCTs in a similar way. So the outer retina, in fact, in okay. the, in this one side, minute left. Okay. So the outer retina is actually quite uh, healthy, but ERG is again, you know, uh, abnormal. And so this children, uh, both these children have a mutation in RPA65. And the take home is that in the presence of a normal fundus in imaging, ERG and even under GA may be essential for a diagnosis. The next one is the last. I'm going to skip this through, but a four-year-old child who eventually got diagnosed, you know, with a, a, a retinal dystrophy and RDH12 mutation. But what is important is this child's vision was 624 and 660, you know, when we saw him. But so you know, this is very classical of an, what we call an RDH12 LCA. But what is important is that. Um, this was the uh, mutation. What is important is that the child underwent amblyopia treatment for a year. And what we found that the child's vision improved considerably to about 615 and 618, which is significantly a uh, you know, improvement over the earlier uh, vision. So the take home is that appropriate refraction amblyopia management in children is very, very uh, crucial, even in the presence of retinal dystrophy. So to conclude, pediatric retinal dyst dystrophy diagnosis can be very challenging. And imaging, you know, of all kinds should be, you know, uh, mandatory. And in the face of all the therapies that are coming up, genetic testing should be offered to every family. Thank you so much. And amazingly, Chris talk. It was truly an idea. Thank you. So Ma'am, uh, ma uh, wonderful talk, as always. Uh, just uh, you uh, showed all the uh, genome sequencing. Whole exome sequencing. Exo exome uh, sequencing. And as well as even in ABC4, there are 700 different alleles which are uh, expressed. And this SPTB1 is also as you showed. So if, uh, for example, if a patient comes with retinitis pigmentosa, x link being the most aggressive and autosomal dominant being the most milder form. And uh, three, three different uh, genes which uh, the RHO or the usher type 2 or the RP is the GTPS. How do you actually advise uh, genetic testing in the case of retinitis pigmentosa? So, uh, you know, what you're talking about is the autosomal dominant mutations. It is important to know that uh, a complete phenotype genotype correlation is very difficult. It's a guesswork at best. You know, when you see a lot of patients, you can say that this is a mutation, maybe we'll test for it. 
but you know especially in a situation like ours where the patient spends from his or you know, from their pocket you don't want to do just panels so what you're talking about is just look for those specific mutations okay so when you do a panel you they will only look for a specific set of mutations or a single mutation but the trouble is whether the patient pays 5000 or 10000 once they've paid and then you have to say look i did not identify a mutation now i will do the next set of mutations is very difficult right so i typically what i do is uh, uh, i i do only a whole exome sequencing now you know uh, some labs also have something called an exome panel and so on it's best to do the proband and both the parents in fact a lot of times the parents are not you know uh, uh, in the in, in bangalore for example so i connect them to a local ophthalmologist and get, get an eye examination done to make sure the parents themselves are not carriers first of all so you have the clinical examination of the parents first and then you do an exome sequencing of all three the reason is if you identify a mutation in the proband let's say you know in your patient now if the if if there are especially with an exome sequencing they'll come up with about three or four mutations now you don't know which of them is the one that is actually causing the disease so and they will in, in, in fact in all of these reports you will find something called segregation analysis to be done all it means is that the parents have to be tested and if if both the parents carry one copy of the mutation each and the you know a child is carrying two mutations you have the answer so it's best to do a whole exome sequencing of the it's called a trio sequencing you do both the parents and the child so you know it's becoming you know uh, uh, less and less expensive it's still not something that can be you know possible for everyone but it is becoming more and more affordable you know as we go ma'am uh, just uh, this uh, issue to the uh, correlation between the imaging and autofluorescence like uh, uh, like the for example star guards uh, i think uh, deepika will show more like the there are three uh, types of autofluorescence uh, correct so is it uh, uh, possible to uh, correlate between uh, certain type of uh, mutation with uh, these sort of fluorescence level or is it always uh, uh, these kind of uh, genetic testing does it uh, really help in prognosticating uh, the uh, natural history of the disease for the patient ah, that's a very good question it is definitely possible to prognosticate okay one of course based on the autofluorescence itself you know you mentioned there are three different that you know uh, uh, people have shown and uh, you know based on whether it's diffuse focal and so on you can actually uh, you know prognosticate how severe the disease is but definitely based on uh, the mutations you can prognosticate for example there's one glycine mutation that is known which is a very mild mutation it's called a 1961 mutation it's a it's a mild mutation so it's just that you know like you mentioned there are so many alleles so then when you have a mutation you know report like this the person then has to go in. ideally it's preferable to have a geneticist who will do this you know for you so then they'll be able to tell you whether this is a very severe mutation especially with stargard there are very mild mutations and very severe mutations so mutation analysis for a prognostication is very uh, uh, essential and it's possible it's just that if you know you or i are doing it we really have to spend a lot of time but otherwise it's definitely possible you know for a geneticist rather easily uh sir may sir uh, uh gopal sir any um, uh, tips for ordering uh, genetic test even purnachandra can answer uh, is it really does it make a difference to our patients i don't think i have anything more to add after uh, rajini the specialist has given her expert comments nothing much really thank you I see only ashray just to sorry sir can you say something now since you asked that question about whether that you know it's it's something that we should do more and more you know with more and more gene therapies coming up if we we have too many patients but if we don't have the genetic data we are actually going to do a disservice to our patients so uh, can we take home this message that genetic testing uh, for at least the most commonly recurring uh, uh entities like rp or uh, star guards we should do whole exome sequencing and maybe yes. a proband between the children and the parents absolutely yes oh, oh. yeah i just what, what i wanted to uh, tell i totally agree with ma'am what she told uh, before genetic testing the counseling as ma'am told is something very important 
so it's not like you know one time test uh, most of the time we end up still it may remain inconclusive even after doing whole exam sequencing also and we need to follow up this patient not only clinically from the genetic test point of view for example if a mutation is reported as pathogenic after 2 years if the literature when it gets updated it may become likely pathogenic so all those possibilities are there the patient that we need to like we can't label okay you have a mutation so this is the thing so that needs to be explained to the patient and we need to keep revisiting this uh, genetic diagnosis also and uh, most importantly the follow -up. so as of now we don't have much data on the follow up and the progression for a particular mutation so once you accumulate lot of data like that will answer your question like particular mutation corresponding out of fluorescence the possible progression rate so we are still uh, learning that okay thanks purna uh, ma'am yeah yeah so thank you very much uh, we shall now go on uh, to our next speaker and dr rajni do stay on with us um, we have our next speaker dr deepika parameshwarappa who is currently a clinical fellow in ocular genetics electrophysiology and inherited retinal diseases at the hospital for sick children toronto and her areas of interest are inherited retinal diseases uh, retinitis pigmentosa ocular genetics and electrophysiology and uh, we truly look forward to hearing her talk on role of fundus autofluorescence in pediatric retinal conditions so on to you dr deepika thank you i need to share my screen i hope it is in full screen now yes. am i audible yeah oh, thank you a very good evening uh, everyone Thank you, team IADU, Dr. Chitra, and Dr. Ashrai for this opportunity. I'll begin with my talk. The outline of my talk includes overview on types of autofluorescence, application of autofluorescence in various pediatric retinal diseases, and I'll be covering majorly the inherited retinal dystrophies. Uh, as we saw in Dr. Batu's case, that uh, every case had autofluorescence imaging. So it is a day-to-day -day imaging modality in a case of retinal dystrophy, which helps in both diagnosis and progression. Uh, through the series of cases which I'll be showing, uh, I'll also highlight on the diagnostic value of autofluorescence, both in terms of qualitative and quantitative. Uh, the autofluorescence are broadly categorized into short wavelength and long wavelength. The short wavelength autofluorescence captures the information on lipofuscin in RPE, whereas the near infrared spectrum captures the information on RPE melanin more than the choroidal melanin. The major difference between these two modalities is that in the short wavelength, we have the central macular hypoautofluorescence, whereas the, on the other hand, in the near infrared, we will have a central hyperautofluorescence due to high melanin at the center. Depending on the field of image captured, it can be a small of 30 degree field or a 55 degree or an ultra wide field, 200 degree image. Why it is advantageous to perform autofluorescence in pediatric group? It is a non-invasive and quick imaging modality. We can perform in as young as five years of age. And if we have the tabletop spectralis machine, it is very easy to uh, take autofluorescence even during UA. It's an adjunct imaging modality, which tells us about the photoreceptors and RPE health. It detects changes that are invisible to fundus examination, and at times it is superior to fundus photography. It provides disease-specific distribution of lipofuscin and melanin, which helps in diagnosis as well as monitoring. So let's begin with the series of cases. I'll cover with retinitis pigmentosa, which is the most common rod cone dystrophy which we see. And we all know that RP is an umbrella term, which is caused due to various mutations in various genes, uh, approximately more than 100 genes. So if we look here, why why is that a disease which is uh, which is called as rod cone dystrophy, has so much variety of autofluorescence. And the autofluorescence varies from a lack of autofluorescence to a constricting hyperautofluorescent ring to a hypoautofluorescent ring, also some variety of speckled and stippled autofluorescence. So it depends actually on the genes involved and the mutations involved. For example, autofluorescence in mutations of visual cycle genes usually will have a generalized dark or absent autofluorescence. The foveal region in short wavelength and near infrared uh, wavelength will be complementary. Majority of the times, we don't see a uh, hyper autofluorescent ring uh, in the visual cycle genes, except for RLBP1, which we are seeing over here. 
these are the two examples of visual cycle genes. Uh, on the left hand, we can see RDH5 fundus albipunctatus, where we can see this fine white dots. And in the autofluorescence, there is total loss of autofluorescence. We don't see it is not a bad quality image. There's no autofluorescence. On the other hand, it is RP65, early onset retinal dystrophy, like uh, Dr. Batu had showed. This autofluorescence here, we can barely see an autofluorescence. So these genes indicate that there is a lifelong impairment in the retinoid recycling. Thus, they lack the lipofuscin accumulation, and this is very diagnostic clue for uh, visual cycle genes, especially RP65. On the other hand, the autofluorescence mutation involving phototransduction genes show hyper autofluor centering, which is better appreciated in the near infrared autofluorescence, and macula is usually brighter than the surrounding region. The structure correlation of autofluor centering is well understood now with, uh, here, with the understanding of uh, inside the ring, all the structures in the retinal layers are maintained if it is hypo autofluorescent. And just at the ring, what we see is uh, ONL uh, thickness reduction and ELM, intact ELM with loss of photoreceptors. And outside the ring, it is severe loss of ONL, ELM, and ISOS. This is very important for prognostication, like we were discussing in the previous talk, that construction of the ring and affection of these layers will be monitored uh, on follow up visits. Uh, one more important thing to consider is in primary celiopathies, which are the disorders involving the non motile cilia of the eye as well as other body parts of the um, other body parts and these are syndromic uh, uh, syndromic irds which we call them what is typical and seen in majority of the cases is this speckled autofluorescence which we see there is dots of hypo hyper and this is also the dot of hypo and hyper uh, it's similar in this case as well so the major disorders one need to consider is uh, usher syndrome a uh, nephron of 164 barded beadle syndrome and RPGR is an X-linked RP, but it is also a celiopathy. Uh, one need to look for uh, respiratory symptoms in this. So the take-home message here will be that whenever he is, whenever we see a young kid with this pattern of autofluorescence, please look at or rule out the syndromic association carefully. There's one interesting entity called females of X-linked retinitis pigmentosa, and the females of XLRP can be an asymptomatic carrier to a manifesting carrier. That means on the one hand, they're just carrying, other hand, they're carrying plus manifesting the disease. What is uh, peculiar for all these uh, uh, images which I've put is this radiating feathery-like autofluorescence, which is uh, which is uh, traversing away from the macular region. Uh, this is an asymptomatic carrier of RPGR. This is again an RP2 uh, manifesting carrier, and this is, well, this is also an X-linked RP where we see this uh, typical reflex. So we can uh, remember these patterns to understand and solve the case both phenotypically and genotypically. The next common, this is the Stargardt's ABCA4 retinopathy. In Stargardt's, how, how it helps is in disease understanding by correlating this areas of hypo to hyper autofluorescence to the structural OCT, which again helps in visual prognostication. We can also understand the flex correlation. For example, here, the yellow ring is the hyper autofluorescent uh, flex, which uh, when correlated to OCT, it shows as that the deposit is at the outer retinal layer. And the other end, a hyper autofluorescent flex here shows that there is uh, already loss of uh, ellipsoid zone at this uh, area with less deposit. It can also help in assessing age of flex and progression. So these are hyper uh, autofluorescent flex here, and with time, most of them will become hypo autofluorescent, uh, hypo autofluorescent, which indicates progression. Doctor, one minute same... Oh, okay, okay. I'll quickly show a few more uh, uh, scenarios. So this is how it helps in Stargard. And like we discussed previously, we have various uh, classification of Stargard based on the autofluorescence uh, appearance, which again helps in uh, prognostication. In acromatopsia, we can have a normal fundus, but varied hyper autofluorescence. And that's why it becomes very important that in a normal autofluorescence, in a normal looking fundus, we can have a change in autofluorescence. Uh, this is choroidermia, which helps in assessing progression when we overlay the image of baseline to, uh, to the follow-up visits. That uh, thus it helps in a quantitative assessment. 
we all are aware of best and best trophinopathy spectrum of classic vitelliform macular dystrophy and autosomal recessive best trophinopathy. They both have a typical uh, appearance in various stages, uh, which is uh, which is almost always specific. Uh, this is a double ring concert uh, autofluorescence, which is seen in NR2E3 associated uh, enhanced escone syndrome. We see a two ring which progresses outwards on progression and an inner ring which progresses inwards. Uh, miscellaneous uh, diagnostic clues include in abetes, we can better appreciate uh, the areas of autofluorescence with darker patch to a slightly less darker patch. And in an RDH12 associated isolated macular dystrophy, we can see this uh, amoeboid shape autofluorescence with a thick band of hyperautofluorescent ring. And we can also see isolated lesions uh, said that these lesions should not be confused for an inflammatory lesion. A mitochondrial disorders mid, that is maternally inherited diabetes and deafness, uh, almost always will have this circular dark shaped patches, which is predominantly in the macula and also can involve in the uh, peripapillary area. I just have uh, two more slides. In children, so one need to consider that when we're imaging uh, the premature or very early uh, age kids, we need to have in mind that the autofluorescence takes time to develop. Hence, um, uh, like for example, at 39 weeks, we don't see any autofluorescence. At 62 weeks, we gradually uh, try to see some brighter autofluorescence here at the macula and the blood vessels are uh, becoming more prominent now. Uh, other important uh, indications will be optic dissolution. We will never forget that because it is very simple and effective to differentiate between uh, true to pseudo -dyskedema. Uh, various studies have shown in stickler, aniridia, and foveal hypoplasia association as well. Basically, it can be used in any disease involving photoreceptor, RP, and choroid. Uh, very rare diseases like combined hematoma, retinal scars, inflammatory, and tumors of choroid and retina, also it can be used. To summarize, the fundus autofluorescence provides broader picture, invisible to regular fundus imaging in kids, especially with ultra-wide field autofluorescence. Early detection is possible, especially in diseases like acromatopsia and in Stargardt disease with a normal fundus and OCT, which was highlighted uh, in uh, two cases of Dr. Batu as well. There are typical signs of autofluorescence which can correlate with genotypical diagnosis. Monitoring of progression is possible by understanding the size and extent. Autofluorescence is uh, uh, an important imaging modality in uh, kids. And said that uh, we require a multifunctional hand for our kids for proper understanding and treatment of the diseases, which includes proper phenotyping with uh, the imaging. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'm really sorry for passing few minutes. Uh, yes. So Deepika, uh, uh, amazing talk, uh, amazing pictures, uh, and uh, such a nice collection. But I was so intrigued by all those uh, Robson holder rings, the uh, rings uh, which kept on uh, uh, recurring in almost uh, most of the things. And uh, in the Shurek et al. in 2017, it does uh, uh, describe about the transition, the rings represent the transition between normal and abnormal retina. And they are ever expanding. Uh, is there uh, any uh, mark? Do you consider these uh, uh, rings or the double ring sign, which we, uh, occurs in other uh, other than retinitis pigmentosa also? Uh, can we uh, use it as a biomarker in uh, um, uh, detecting the progression of uh, these kind of diseases, or can we? use uh, vitamin A uh, supplements to curtail its progression uh, based on whatever literature is there. You have thoughts on it. Thank you. Coming to your first part of the question. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so no, you're not very visible. Not We're not able to hear you. It comes in uh, bursts. I don't know. One second. It was very clear. Right. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the concentric rings are uh, very important in monitoring progression. Uh, so how we can monitor is by assessing the size of the ring one, 
and also uh, i mean in the circular way the other part is to assess the edges of the ring to see whether it is a narrow ring or a broad ring and one more thing what is important is as you mentioned like inside the ring we see that it is a normal retina but there are studies and we also see in day to day life that uh, whenever we perform a functional correlation to the inside of the ring if the function is remaining in the uh, inside of the ring whether it is assessed by multifocal eag or pattern eag there is always a good correlation between the uh, ring progression and pattern eag so if we see that all the structures are maintained inside the ring there is also a good functional correlation which again explains us and helps in uh, monitoring the patient and telling them or advising them or counseling them on how the disease is progressing that is one part the second part is the double concentric ring which we saw like i showed in one of my case of nr2e3 which causes enhanced cone syndrome it shows a two ring pattern which is like outside you have one more ring and inside you we have one more ring this is seen in nr2e3 but it is not specific to that we can see in other dystrophies too i feel that with the availability of wide field imaging these rings are becoming more prominent now and we are trying to appreciate it more the third question of yours uh, was the vitamin a supplementation so vitamin a supplementation i know it is a very big uh, controversial topic in the management of irds and the previous studies on the original initial study was done by burson et al on the vitamin a supplementation on various retinas this pigmentosa they showed that the erg values were maintained on uh, i think it's a long follow up on 5 to 10 years so initially it was thought that we can prescribe vitamin a to all cases of retinitis pigmentosa but the point was in the previous study as it was very old study there was the patients were not genot genotype we did not know the exact gene uh, which is causing the rp in these patients so then as we understood the genotype uh, we realized that the vitamin a supplementation is not good for all types of rp so what one need to exclude is especially in the abca4 mutation associated like in star guards and abca4 can also ca cause the isolated cone dystrophy as well as retinitis pigmentosa uh, strictly vitamin a should not be given so in that way i would say that uh, without a proper genotype or if you are not understanding a correct phenotype uh, do not prescribe vitamin a unless and until we are uh, sure that it is not something related to abca4 if you rule out abca4 then definitely we can give low dose of vitamin a and it shows that uh, it is uh, it, it reduces slows the progression i hope i answer you yeah, yeah. thank uh, you uh, so the i think um, rajni ma'am or uh, any senior solvers can also take yeah, yeah. uh, this comment on this uh, the best um, with uh, vitelli form dystrophy is as a spectrum and uh, uh, in order of fluorescence actually clinches the uh, lot of these things so the the adult vitelli form uh, and the like uh, do we really have to do a genetic testing in bvmds is what my question is so is it really necessary Should I go ahead, yeah. Doctor? Yes, yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So th that's a very interesting question because uh, on the one hand we are talking uh, for the dystrophies to do a whole exam or a retinal dystrophy panel for retinitis pigmentosa patients. On the other hand, we are talking about this best spectrum, which are very typical, and by phenotype almost you can say that this is the gene. So how do we approach them? Should we go for whole exam sequencing or a specific gene? a one gene uh, specific that's, test that's, uh, that's what is your question yeah, yeah. Uh, so i would say especially in the best spectrum if we are sure like you know uh, about the uh, best phenotype we have a shorter panel for the best uh, phenotype only which includes best uh, one and there are two more other genes a uh, few more uh, basically which can cause the best phenotype like impg1 and impg2 so if you narrow down the panel this trophy panel then we can uh, go for that itself and it is very important to do genetic testing we cannot leave on that that uh, it is best and i will i need not do genetic testing we should not do that we should do genetic testing to understand how it is transmitted in the family members which helps in 
you know, the future risk of the future pregnancy, future family, uh, as well as this best is associated with glaucoma. We should remember that they're associated with this very uh, badly behaving angle closure glaucoma, which runs in family. So, yes, do the genetic testing. Maybe we can choose a panel of vitally formed dystrophy uh, genes uh, because we, we, we are very confident about the phenotype. And uh, but do it for uh, do it uh, for the family members as well, like uh, Dr. Rajini mentioned. Any other question from the? Can I make a quick comment? Yes, yes. 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 So this is this is just about the vitamin A. Uh, you know, I agree with what Deepika said about the rest. Uh, you know, including the best. <laughs> now with vitamin A, uh, one of the uh, troubles with Stargard therapy has been, uh, you know. Um, uh, because the gene is so large, there has been a constant struggle for gene therapy for Stargard. So the other things that people are looking at is pharmacological therapy for uh, Stargard. Mm -hmm. So there's a company that's entered phase two trials in the US. It's called Alkyos Therapeutics. What they're doing is to um, create a form of vitamin A. It's called Gilda Retinol, where they're trying to uh, 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 avoid the vitamin A dimerization. So therefore, the lipofusin buildup does not happen. It's an oral medication because basically you have to address the lipofusin. You know, either you do something to take up the lipofusin after it's formed or you do something to prevent the lipofusin formation. So most pharmacological, you know, for most companies are trying to do a pharmaceutical therapy because that probably will be the best way to go forward in, you know, star cuts. Thank you. Uh, so, can I make one point about the vitamin A treatment? Yes, sir. Uh, I, I, I remember that when the first presentation came from Boston on the Bessels group, it was become widely popular in India to give vitamin A and E combination. We found that none of those patients who have taken those drugs has there been any delay in the progression. Zero. Actually, we had no success whatsoever. And even before Bessels group has published the data, the routine treatment for all RPs have been dosing them with vitamin A, a lot of vitamin A. So I don't think really it has shown any benefit, uh, even in those cases where they've excluded ABCA and they still want to give because it may be useful for them. I don't know, frankly, whether it's useful or not. Sir, I agree with you. And then you have to keep monitoring them for IAH, sir. Hmm. Because of the raised ICP that they can develop because of excess vitamin exactly, A. Exactly. And also hepatic problems. Yes, yeah. Also in pregnancy, the child-bearing age group and all its like lot of factors. Ma'am, okay. No, but that was a wonderful talk, that Bhutti Pipika. I mean, uh, truly uh, interesting. We go on to our next speaker, Dr. Anand Vinegar, who's a pro professor and program director of the Kidrop, and he also heads the Department of Pediatric Retina at Narayan Netraya Institute. And uh, it's amazing the amount, number of awards and accolades he's got and um, uh, good work experience. He eternally looks young, but he has a work experience of 20 years. So let's hear what he has to say about the imaging pearls in ROP screening and laser. On to you, Dr. Anand. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, and thank you, Ashray, for this uh, opportunity. Right. So I'm going to talk about uh, some imaging pearls. So let's get straight to it. So the ICROP3 classification is now sort of got a world representation. I'm just going to highlight a few important things that we can appreciate, especially from imaging. So this knuckle-like thing appearance that goes into zone one is now called a notch. Now this is different from the entire disease being in zone one, both from a prognostication and possibly how we're going to treat as well. The other thing that imaging really helps in is this plus disease. So earlier, we were forced to say no plus, three plus, and plus. Unfortunately, even now we have to do that. But there's a larger acceptance that there is a big amount of variation, uh, that there could be a variance of some amount of pre plus and plus. And very soon, the ICROP3 committee will come out with a P score. And we hope that that will solve it, like nine pictures with which you can compare what you're seeing. Aggressive posterior ROP, that term was now changed to aggressive ROP. By definition, it means that the word posterior was dropped, which means even anterior uh, diseases can be very severe. I'm only going to show you examples. So here is some anterior ghosting blood vessels that look as though they've gone up to the periphery, but uh, look at the capillary non-perfusion and all the uh, dropout areas, which make it very severe. 
This one, it looks like a dull image, but it's because it's a small pupil tunica vasculosa lentis. This was what was classically described as hybrid ROP from the PGI group, but basically has fibrovascular proliferation and aggressive ROP. But now hybrid has also got classified as part of aggressive ROP. And this is when we were classically expecting tortures and dilatation, we must also accept that nowadays it can be occluded and sclerotic versions as well. Here's a very different form of aggressive ROP that we see a lot in India. That's the hemorrhagic variety or the vasculitic variety. And you can see even perivascular exudation in some of the segments. Now, these are the images from the uh, manuscript itself. Some of them have contributions from India. Just to show you that an FFA can really help to pick it up. Then other two terms that were important in this classification, which uh, through imaging I'll try to demonstrate, is reactivation. Now, reactivation basically by that word means that uh, the disease went away and has come back again. So this is best seen with an image. So either the tortuosity can come back, so the reactivation can be from a plus perspective or from a rich perspective or both. And they can happen in different locations. They can happen in the area of the primary disease, a new location or both. Having talked about angiogram, now we have the capacity of doing the angiography on pediatric patients, not just in the RedCam3, but on the Indian Forest Neo HD as well. And this just completed a clinical trial. Uh, these are very standard operating procedures in terms of uh, what's the dosing and how you do it and where you do it under which monitoring. I'm only going to give you a few examples. Now, we know anti-VEGF has really taken the uh, treatment of ROP by storm. But what's really important is to understand that while it has a very good impact and while it does very well initially, uh, we have to take care of this other word called persistent avascular retina. And that is the incomplete regression. And that's the second term. Now, 10 weeks after that drug, you will see that the baby is putting on a lot of weight, four, four and a half, even five kgs. But when you do an angiogram, a large area. And what is large? More than two disc diameters of avascular retina is now considered significant persistent avascular retina. And an angiogram really helps you determine that where to draw the line for the laser, and then they do very well. Here's another case, 12 weeks after Avastin, both eyes have early recurrence. So this recurrence can be better picked up on angiography when there's leakage, and they don't have to be similar in both eyes. Here in one eye, there's a notch going more posteriorly, and here it's more anteriorly in the right eye. Sometimes you get an asymmetric recurrence, and here also angiogram works. So here's the vasculitic occluded variety of aggressive ROP. Eight weeks after injection, one eye seems to be going towards the periphery, but look at the left eye. Now this is almost like an early 4A. It's a stage 3 early 4A where the fibrosis are large. So here you don't have to hurriedly go do laser for both eyes. You can deal with the left eye now because of course it's laserable. And the right eye we continue to follow up and it's only 12 more weeks later when we said, okay, now it is persistent avascular retina. And what's important here is when you follow up these babies long enough, if you've done adequate laser and taken care of the ischemia, look at this baby, despite having a more fibrovascular proliferation and an almost zone one laser in the left eye, the vision is equal and the myopia is also almost equal. What I'm trying to show you is that uh, there need not be a large amount of anisometropia just because you did a more posterior laser. Here are examples of uh, bevacizumab and then I'll show you ranibizumab as well. Uh, so here's uh, a very occluded variety, aggressive. So what happens is initially there is even further occlusion, an occluded variety where you see that the blood vessels are simply not growing. Here you just have to be patient. And after some time, they perfuse and the blood vessels start growing forward. This is six weeks after that intravitreal uh, ranibizumab. But one week after that, just one week after it was looking hunky-dory, you start seeing the recurrence. And this can be very severe to begin with. And of course, if you do the laser, then they do well. There's another concept where imaging helps is posterior laser, and we can even prevent, of course, you can see the date here, more than 15 years ago. Here, uh, this baby was actually positioned for a vitrectomy, a lens pairing, but the mother said absolutely no doing vitrectomy. So we tried what at that time, and now, of course, better described as posterior laser. And you can see that many of these babies, you can obviate the need of vitrectomy if you take care of the posterior laser. Of course, there are other rules to be followed as well. And this was the final outcome. This child is now 15 plus years old. The other times that laser will work and imaging helps in monitoring this is when there's exudation. So you know there's a tractional and an exudative component of 4A or even sometimes 4B. So sometimes uh, not all of the, say the traction is on your left, which is the nasal quadrant and this is the temporal quadrant. And what I'm trying to show here, uh, here is that the exudation sometimes comes down to a minimal but doesn't go away, but enough to obviate the need of surgery and the other side may completely go away. Now here's a case where this is probably a 
you know, bad case of aggressive ROP would do very well for so with the anti VEGF, but uh, because of the risk of crunch, and you can see on the angiogram, we have chosen to do laser. And what I'm trying to show you here is after meticulous laser and doing posterior laser with good uh, disappearance of the tunica vasculosa lentis, I'll quickly move to the last uh, follow up of this baby completely gone. So you can see here that there's a good foveal revascular zone. There's no residual fibrosis. The plus is gone. Even the disc is healthy. So it's all possible. Uh, and you can prevent the other eye as well. So they're doing equally well. And sometimes, uh, and this one, this child is almost a year old, has been injected and lasered elsewhere. The vision is only 20 by 1400. And the angiogram allows you to show how the disease is still active. You can still, still see the active, uh, uh, you know, leak, and you can see the incompletely done laser. And only when you map this out with an angiogram and complete the laser, as you can see on the right panel, does it start doing well and the leakage completely goes away. And of course, the vision also improves. In some recent advances, I'm just going to talk about one or two. One is the OCT angiography. This was our very first case that we did a flying baby position and showed that uh, the flat neovascularization that was not just on top, but also had deeper extensions in the deeper capillary plexus, which if you targeted laser on that, then you could uh, get away with just doing that much laser and the neovascularization disappeared. This was our follow-up study. These children were about... Uh, the age 5 to 10, they all had 6, 9 or better vision. They were either preterm who did not have treatment or type 1 ROP that needed treatment or type 2 that was spontaneously resolved. And what I'm trying to show you here is that despite having good vision and normal... Doctor, treatment, one minute left. Sure, thank you. Uh, the foveal avascular zone can be so abnormal in these cases. And when you do the on fast, you can see that a lot of them have fovea plana. So even though they have good vision, OCT sometimes gives you a better insight on how their fovealization has developed. Finally, I'm going to end with uh, AI. So we've been working with a few groups on AI, and now we have a fairly modest uh, accuracy of about 90%. We are now busy integrating it with our telemedicine platform. This was our most recent publication, where we're using it as a tool not only to uh, integrate with our telemedicine platform, but also to train technicians to get them to the level. And finally, I'm going to tell you that imaging in pediatric retina, and especially ROP, has come into the limelight for because of all the medical legal cases. So if you have the access to image and uh, document the progression and the treatment, uh, then of course, there's nothing better. So thank you very much for this opportunity. I'd like to uh, acknowledge all the collaborators we work with, uh, beginning with Government of India. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anand. That was a great talk and so much uh, work has gone into it. Curiosity. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Anand has been a uh, great inspiration and uh, he also graduated from National Law School and uh, uh, covered the medical legal aspects. Uh, just uh, uh, wanted to ask on the uh, PAR, that is uh, persistent avascular retina in the anti vegf era, sir. How do you manage it? Uh, 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 what are the imaging pearls you would give us uh, to uh, 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 space out the um, follow-ups? Because it can persist in... As, as per Peter Campbell's paper, up to six, seven years also. So at least in uh, for the 180 days, how do you space it out, sir? And what are the imaging pulse you would be? Ashrek, can I modify your question? Uh, yeah. I mean, just, just for my, I mean, there are a lot of centers we don't we don't have access to the flocine angiographies till now. So how do you manage par in context with a, just the clinical picture rather than sure. having flocine picture also, sir? Because you have access to that, but many of centers don't have access to flows and angiography. So can you just like so at the outset, I must add, thank you for the question. It's one of the most difficult questions to answer in today's uh, relevant ROP scenario. But having said that, the, the good news that I want to place here is the Indian ROP Society has created a subcommittee which is deliberating as we speak. And in the forthcoming AIOS, we are going to actually come out with the guidelines and we are hoping to publish it in the IJO very shortly. Now, let me summarize that unpublished work because this is the brainchild of a lot of people who put in the hard work. Uh, now, uh, the follow-up might differ based on the type of drug you're using. So, bevacizumab, we know, has slightly later recurrences. And so, therefore, the frequency of follow-up may be uh, less frequent. Ranibizumab has the earliest recurrences and very more severe recurrences. So, the follow-up may be uh, more frequent. And ILEA, as of now, has somewhere in between. So, having said that, uh, if you inject now, you might want to see weekly for the first four weeks and then two weekly thereafter until two things happen. Either there is a recurrence and as I just mentioned, the average age of recurrence 
in uh, a rare case would be between uh, 12 and 16 weeks. And uh, ranibizumab typically is between 6 and 10 weeks, so much earlier. Just a recurrence, then you go ahead and do laser. But if you don't, and that's Ashna's question, how do you monitor PAR? So here, uh, and also Abhishek's question of how do you monitor it without angiogram? So you don't need an angiogram for this. Uh, I was just trying to demonstrate its utility in uh, refining PAR. So what I'm saying is once you sort of follow up these babies long enough, uh, you have to determine four or five things. Firstly, what is the weight of the baby, the current weight of the baby? As the baby puts on weight more than four, four and a half kgs, it is assumed that there is sufficient insulin growth factor in the blood, which means that the blood vessel should also grow, VEGF is adequate, and normalization of vascularization should have happened. But if that's not happening, so that's one red flag. Secondly, what is the age of the baby? Fovilization and periphery should have become normal between 44 to 48 weeks, give or take up to 50 second week. The expected due date. So that should be your mental cutoff. 48 weeks, four and a half kgs. And then, of course, we are in India where follow up is so difficult, especially for our rural mothers. So that should be a very important criteria. Can the mother keep coming back every two weeks, three weeks, four weeks until you decide it? And the fourth important criteria we're going to put down in that guideline is does your institute or center have the capability of doing these are under general anesthesia or sedation? If your answer is no, and you're comfortable doing laser under topical only to about three and a half, four kgs, and the baby is already 44 weeks, then you might want to consider lasering the peripheral avascular retina. So this is the short answer, but in a very detailed algorithm, we will publish these guidelines very soon. Sir, uh, 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 just uh, want you to, because you showed me that uh, in, uh, handled OCT also. Can you just uh, uh, say one or two per one pearl on um, macular edema of prematurity, sir? So macular edema prematurity is something that we sort of serendipitously discovered about 12, 13 years ago, uh, where we were trying to image the ridge and by chance we found this what looked like uh, exactly cystoid macular edema. At that point, we did not know that there were two patterns, but we found two distinct patterns. Uh, but both of them occurred somewhere between 37 and 42nd week. And we noted that all of them spontaneously regressed by the 52nd week. We also noticed that uh, when we compared, con compared it to the controls, those babies who had the edema had slightly lower vision in the first third month and the sixth month, but they made up by the first year, of course, with vision stimulation. What we know now is that the second pattern, the pattern B of edema, where you don't see the CME-like picture, but you see intraretinal spaces in the parafoveal region, this could be a surrogate marker for cortical vision impairment. And this is uh, good work has been done by the Duke University, and we use it in our institute as a marker for CVI. So these are roughly what we do. And now it Days we have even found it in babies uh, with the disease or even with our post anti VEGF, but the initial discovery was on babies who had just type 2 ROT. Uh, sir, is there a, a time for one question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, sir, uh, I wanted to ask about few of my patients that uh, I have lately seen. There are three or four patients who have undergone laser and there was peripheral proliferation in the temporal area. And it is keeping stable, but they are floating vessels. So should I be worried about these floating vessels? Like they, they are just connecting to that peripheral ridge, but so they are stable post, post laser. So do you find this in your picture or it is unique to me or something like that? Uh, so if you have done a posterior laser in these stage three cases and you've gone back and done what's called the interval laser. So you would have lasered all the anterior aspect avascular retina and you would have put a couple of rows posteriorly. And then after a few weeks, when that interval area becomes completely flat, if you've gone back and done interval laser, then you're unlikely to find this in the long term. But however, if you can't, or if you have not, or the patient's lost to follow up and you're not done the interval, then some of them do start floating like vitreous floaters. Uh, but as long as there's no active traction, number one, number two, you, there are no skip areas of any capillary non-perfusion uh, and the rest of the disease is resolved. I don't think you need to worry too much about it, especially if this is within the uh, lasered bed of the retina. It is within the lasered bed. But then they are floating. It looks very dangerous. Right, right. No, if they are floating, clearly by that definition, they don't have any active traction. But I would urge you to look at these babies when you are doing the posterior laser to go back and do interval in a gap of three to four weeks. Then you will stop seeing these floaters and they'll do much better. Bless my opinion. Ma'am. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Anand. So we go on to our next speaker, Dr. Purna Chandra, who is a picture retina surgeon and Consultant in the Department of Electrophysiology and Clinical Genetics at Narayan Nitralia. He has had additional training in inherited retinal disorders and electrophysiology from Murphy's Eye Hospital, 
has uh, has done some more learning in the site safe site in Sydney Sydney and is a PhD scholar from Maastricht University Netherlands and of course so many best paper awards so let's hear from you pearls in electrophysiology of pediatric pregnancy disorders so on to you Dr. Poona. So thank you so much for the kind introduction ma'am. I'll just start sharing my screen. So I hope my slides are visible in uh, full screen mode. Mm. So is my voice clear? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So thank you so much, Chitra Ma'am and Ashray for this opportunity. So the my topic will be the electrophysiology in uh, pediatric retinal disorders. So the moment if someone refers me to, you know, ERG in pediatric, first thing is it's very difficult. So the reason being the ERG testing is different between adult and children. First thing is they want to run away. And the second thing is they're scared. What are they going to do on me? And getting the drops in and getting a good dilatation is a challenge. You should be able to place the electrodes, able to present light stimulate to the child, able to complete the test, able to come fix it in some of the tests which require good fixation like pattern or multifocal test. There are ways or uh, possible solutions. So in infants, you can use elbow splint to keep the fingers away from pulling off the electrodes. I can reinforce the electrodes and wires with a sticky plaster, get parents to hold. And one useful thing which we do is uh, you can show them the pictures of other children who have electrodes to show them it's not scary. So sometimes after seeing this, they do you know, become a little cooperative. And uh, other things which we need to consider is in infant, there is a decrease in B -way, A wave and B wave amplitude, increased latency. And there will be some immature waveforms which develops most in six months and approaches adult level by the age of one year. I'll just, uh, I'll just briefly tell what are the different form of ERG, what we do. One is full field ERG, which represents functions of the entire retina, pattern ERG predominantly from posterior pole and the ganglion cell. In multifocal ERG, we test each and every point in the macula. So this is how a typical full field ERG printout looks like. I'll explain with the case examples. So this was 11 year old child who presented with uh, blood vision with a vision of 6-9, born out of consanguinous uh, marriage. So when we examined, fundus had vitally formed deposits, uh, which was very obvious on uh, autofluorescence. So OCT also showed some retinal fluid and corresponding vitally formed deposits. And we, we are all sure of the diagnosis. We know what it is. It's the best disease. So when we do an ERG testing, the typically in the dominant best, the full field ERG will be normal. So only the EOG will clinch the diagnosis, that is electroculogram. So this electroculogram is abnormal. In the bright phase, there should have been a peak like this, which is absent. So now in typical cases may not be required. In cases where the vitally formed deposits is not very obvious, this uh, typical normal ERG and abnormal EOG will clinch the diagnosis. So it's important to screen the family member. The father was totally asymptomatic, but when he screened, he did have small vitally formed lesion in the left eye and also found to have a heterozygous mutation in best one gene, suggesting an autosomal pattern of inheritance. So that's about the dominant best disease. So second is a 10-year-old male child born out of consanguinous marriage. They have taken multiple consultation with a vision of 618. There are multiple yellowish uh, deposits in the subretinal area suspected to have some infection, so treated with all possible treatment. So when we did an autofluorescence, Compared to the previous case, the lycofficient distribution, as uh, Shrey was mentioning, it is more extensive. The pattern was slightly, slightly different. And there was both subretinal and intraretinal fluid accumulation. So this is typical of a recessive estrophenopathy. The one which I showed earlier was the dominant one, where only one gene is defective. In recessive, as the name suggests, the, both the genes are defective. So when you do the ERG, the fulfilled ERG will also be affected. And... Uh, EOG will always be flat. It will be, there will be severe amplitude reductions. And uh, the, when we did the genetic testing, the proband had homozygous uh, mutation in this gene, and the parents were heterozygous carriers for this. And it affected sibling had normal genotype. And these patients, uh, especially the recessive ones, as Deepika was telling, they are more prone to develop anger close glaucoma. In my cohort also, I have not seen patient losing vision because of dystrophin mutation itself but they lose vision because of the glaucoma. 
So it's very important to diagnose these cases as early as possible. So primarily, we also need to recognize development of uh, neovascularization against playing contact sports and uh, give anti-VJ for the right time, give protective eyeways, because the Brooks membrane in these patients are little brittle and they are prone to injuries even for, with a trivial trauma. So third case is a 10-year-old female child, vision of 616, fundus photoshoot atrophic covial changes, again, born out of a consanguineous marriage, had one more affected uh, sibling. So this is the autofluorescence and corresponding OCT. And this is very classic. We all know like this is a typical case of a Stargard disease. So we did ERG in this patient. So if you look at this, both the dark adapted and the light adapted responses are affected. So indicating cone rod dysfunction in this. So you might ask me, what is the use? I know the diagnosis. Why do we need to do the ERG in this patient? So ERG wise, this belongs to a type 3 Stargards because Stargard can be of three types based on the ERG. In type 1, the full field ERG is normal in which uh, the proliferation chances are less. In type 2, only cones are affected. Approximately, there will be 18 to 20 percent chance of progression. And if both cones and rods are involved, as in our case, early in the age, there is a more uh, severe progression. So this is all from a follow-up uh, data from Professor Graham Holder's paper. They came out with these approximate numbers. So in a way, we can prognosticate also. And as expected, this patient had mutation in ABCA4 gene, homozygous mutation. So this is something important. What I, this is what I was telling. The ABCA4 can mimic any disease. You can have an ABCA4 mutation, a normal ERG, and an undetectable ERG with a retinitis pigmentosa-like presentation. So it's, it's very important to have a genetic diagnosis. So we, we can give low vision aids, you can give dark aid classes to avoid bright light, which can uh, stop the stimulation of visual cycle, thereby decreasing this retinoid formation. And as we are discussing, we should avoid any form of supplementation. So the fourth case is a six-year-old male who complained of diminution of vision with photophobia and fundus was absolutely normal. This is the typical referrals which I get from the pediatric department. So fundus clinically normal, however, autofluorescence did have subtle changes at the foveola. And OCT also showed ONL thinning with subcovalar cavitation. When you did an ERG, if you look at the dark adapted responses, it's completely normal. The light adapted responses are undetectable. So this is very typical of achromatopsia. So which is a form of stationary cone dystrophy because uh, the cone dystrophies can be early onset stationary and late onset progressive. Uh, achromatopsia falls under the stationary category. Usually don't progress and again depends on the gene involved. So the, this is uh, the pedigree of the same patient. Multiple family members were affected. With the look of it only, you can tell it's a dominant inheritance. And this patient had a heterozygous mutation in GUCY2DG, which can also cause some other retinal dystrophies. The fifth case is 80-year-old male who presented blood vision of 636. Uh, fundus uh, had some background RP changes in the periarchial region. So OCT was very classic. This is X-linked juvenile retinal cases. Most of the time, uh, we be able to cleanse the diagnosis. In some of the cases where there are, uh, the fluid is absorbed, atrophic changes, we may do an ERG, uh, which can always cleanse the diagnosis. The typical finding will be an electronegative ERG. If you look at this dark corrupted responses, the A wave is forming here. The B wave is, instead of going up, it's not even reaching the baseline and it's getting terminated here itself. So this is the classic electronegative ERG, what we can get in... Uh, 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 this uh, uh, extreme juvenile retinal cases group of disorders. So this sixth case is a uh, patient presented with night vision problem. Central vision was good, 6, 9, and 6. So we know the diagnosis. This is a case of retinitis pigmentosa. And OCT is also showing the ellipsoid zone just uh, present in the foveal region. Uh, when we did an ERG, both scotopic and the photopic uh, responses were undetectable. So the reason being the photoreceptor which are present only in the foveal region are not enough to elicit a full field response. So, so usually if the diagnosis is very classic, usually I don't advise uh, full field ERG for these patients unless it's been done for some other academic purpose. I'll show a case example of an abnormal looking retina and asymptomatic patient. This was one such uh, 15 year old male patient who came for routine 6, 6 and 6, uh, but he had multiple is flex like deposits. OCT was normal again. ERG was also normal. So this is a case of benign flex retina. I will show one more similar looking flex like deposit with a normal vision. But this patient uh, told there was some uh, dark adaptation issues and night vision problem. OCT was normal again. 
But if you look at the ERG, so the dark corrupted uh, rod driven responses are almost undetectable. In the combined responses, again, there's a classic electronegative ERG. The light adapted responses are fairly normal. So this is a case of under salvipunctatus, which is a form of congenital stationary nitrines. So this is a typical example for like both the clinical picture might look different, but ERG, so the clinically almost may, may look similar. The first patient has more obvious flex, but the ERG is normal. But the second patient has an electronegative ERG. So this is the typical thing what we teach in electrophysiology. Whatever that appears structurally like something, but that doesn't mean that functionally it is behaving the same way. So this is the last exam case in my series. This is a 10 year old male, low vision since childhood with a vision of 6 by 24. The, the near vision was quite good, N6. And this is the fundus picture in the right eye had almost an excavated lesion at the macula and the left, left eye had just the foveal, outer retinal atrophy in the foveal region. So when he didn't fulfill ERG, it was normal. So basically this is indicating the disease is just localized to the macula and uh, the rest of the fundus is normal in which the progression chances is nil and this is turned out to be a toxoplasma scars later. So to conclude, I would like to say electrophysiology is an important tool to aid diagnosis in various diseases, but it should always be followed by clinical correlation. An isolated autofluorescence or an OCT cannot tell. You need to put everything together and additional genetic information adds strength to our correlation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful talk. Very nice. Uh, in fact, uh, Purna, Hello, Dr. Pudra. Nice Purna, to see you. Thank you. Purna actually has done a lot of work on Sargards and actually uh, won a uh, Colonel Rangachari Award in the recent uh, years. Hey, hello, hello, pa, Rangachari, I'm not going to Pava. Uh, uh, Pava, Pava, sorry. So, uh, just uh, uh, wanted to ask uh, how this ERG actually clinches uh, diagnosis in the case of malingering or uh, in uh, challenging cases where everything looks normal and uh, ERG can make a difference. Uh, you're asking in the malingering, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the thing is, I always keep telling, I didn't include those cases because most of my malingering cases were adult patients since this was a pediatric thing. So no patient should be labeled as malingering and before subjecting them to electrophysiological tests. Okay, so one thing is the fulfilled ERG per se and the second is the VEP aspect of it. Okay, so the ERG, if there is a retinal, most of the cone, uh, you know, dystrophy or stationary night blindness disorders are the one where the fundus can appear normal and ERG will be very classic changes will be seen. So that is one. So suppose let's say it's not the retinal related, something beyond like optic nerve or something. The VEP is a clincher. Again, there you need to be clear, careful. There are two types of VEP, flash and pattern. The pattern VEP can be fake if the patient is not paying attention. If the technician is intelligent enough, they should monitor whether the patient is looking at the checkerboard properly or not. Then only you can come to a conclusion. And flash VEP, they cannot fake it, but flash VEP is not that reliable. So again, you need to put everything in the context and then come to a conclusion. But again, I'll repeat, don't label patient any patient as smelling before subjecting them to electrophysiological tests. Purna, I am in a government hospital and I encounter a lot of cases. So, yeah, you would, so to advise when would be the flash VEP and others would be in ERG also we need to do something. Like if we really... No, are you asking in, in malingering patients? Are you asking? Yeah, in malingering. Uh, maling maling no, no, no. We need to go step by step. First, I do an uh, like uh, for imaging and all that. All that is normal. Then I do the ERG first just to rule out the retinal problems. Then if the ERG is normal, then I'll do the VEP. But unfortunately, it cannot be done on the same day. Mm -hmm. Like once you do the ERG, the patient is dilated. You need to call them uh, one more day. But unfortunately, that's how the order should be. You have to go from cornea to the occipital lobe. Right, right, right. Yeah. Dr. Ashray, can I make a point? Hey, I have absolutely. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Puna. That was a great talk. And with respect to VEP, like uh, Dr. Puna is highlighting on VEP in malingering after we evaluate the imaging ERG. And in VEP, uh, we also have that specific VEP of pattern onset and offset VEP. And it is from low contrast to high contrast. So in a malingering patient, also a child with developmental delay where we are not able to assess the visual potential 
a pattern onset offset VP with the contrast from low as low as 20% to 40%, 60% can uh, actually uh, potentially tell us on what is the amount of vision which is there. Uh, it has from 2020 to 2060, 2200 grading, depending on how low uh, the pattern offset onset VEP can be detected, the low contrast VEP, we can grade the visual acuity. So that is one point which we can, uh, which I wanted to add on pattern VEP. And yeah. the approach, I agree with Dr. Purna for the, you know, how we proceed for malingering and the kids. So that is true. Again, the assistant has to pay offset. And one more yeah. thing, there is an un unpublished data from Professor Graham Holder. It's called focal ERG. So it can be done in most of the machines, only it needs just a setting change. The pattern checkerboard, what we give for a pattern ERG, there is no multiple. So instead of multiple, just give only four, like one white, one black, and black and white, like that. So in that case, if the macular integrity is normal, most of the time it's very difficult to miss. Okay? So that is something which you can do. It, it is not specific to machine. Any machine, you can just change the settings. Uh, but it little requires, you know, the better technician to understand our clinician has to be there so to do that. So, I, in fact, uh, Professor Graham Alder is coming up with a series of focal ERG. I will publish it this soon. I was discussing with the, in the last, I think, APO Bali when we met, he was discussing this. <laughs> so, if VP is totally normal, can there still be a problem? Because for malignant, usually I do pattern VP and if VP comes normal, and, you know, then I think that, you know, things are good. Then, of course, yeah. we do some other tests like, you know, put plus 10 and other things and try to get the child to see. So, I usually would do pat pattern VP and pattern ERG first and then dilate and then do flash ERG if, if I'm looking for malingering. But if my VP comes totally normal, then I will think that there is not any major problem. Maybe he has little cone dysfunction, which is not reflecting in VP, but... That would not be like somebody who's really malingering. Yeah, true, true, ma'am. Yes, so yes, sometimes yes, see, yes. I, like, I had that uh, couple of patients with like uh, achromatic cone dystrophy six nine. I mean, after uh, rolling out the thing, in which VP came out surprisingly, the pattern VP is completely normal because he was able to see at the vision and all. But uh, the fulfilled ERG showed like undetectable cone response. In yeah, fact, no, that's what I'm I had to cross check so, whether it's uh, the same uh, patient. Cone yeah. dystrophy patient will not malinger. Means it will be six nine. No, they won't be like they can't see or they have six thirty six or yes. Uh, no, no, this so, is not in the like context of malingering. Sometimes you know, yeah. like I had a case where the husband brought the wife because she was inattentive, but she was not accepting that she has a problem. She no, was that telling is very common. <laughs> that <laughs> is very common. Those patients yeah, will be it was in that context. <laughs> yeah. So, so we we usually uh, take the patient separately and talk to them. Then they confide yeah. that we don't want to tell our husband. Then sometimes they say that. Okay, now you can tell them, but don't tell them that I yeah. already know. Okay, we will keep their confidence. I think uh, we had an excellent uh, discussion on imaging part. I yes. think we'll, it's time to move on to the surgical session. Yeah. Thank you, one and all. Yes, so uh, on to the surgical pearl session. And uh, the first person to bat is Dr. Abhishek Anand. And he's uh, currently the assistant professor in the Vitruvetna Department and the Regional Institute of Ophthalmology, IJMS Patna. And uh, he has um, his main area of interest are pediatric uh, retinal disorders, myopic uh, macular disorders, and supracoroidal therapeutics and macular buckling. So very interesting. So let's hear from him uh, basic and steps of pediatric retinal surgeries. On to you, Dr. Abhishek. So let's... So am I audible? Yes. So thank you, Ash dear Ashra and Chitra ma'am for interesting me with this talk on basics and steps of pediatric retinal surgery in this very esteemed panel. Thank you. I would like to begin my talk by, we all know that pediatric eyes are not small edit eyes and there are anatomical differences which are there. And this should be come in our surgery when we are trying to start the pediatric vitro retina surgery. They have a narrow palpable fissure, so we require special um, speculum to dissolve. They are small orbits, and this needs to be considered when we are doing buckling. They have a relatively large lens to globe ratio, and this should uh, help us while we are doing a midline cross line and which can do a lens touch. 
The angel eye length is almost 70% of the size when, of the adult eye when they are born. And we are using adult size trocar camera and instruments which can cause trauma if caution is not exercised. The most important is the sclera. Sclera is almost 0.54 millimeter at birth, which is extremely thin. And they are very elastic. And this leads to a risk of intraoperative cannula dislodgement. So you use either sutured infusion cannula or use a cannula which have grips on it. They do have a non valve effect. So unlike adult, you can't get away with many times. There would be a leakage and may lead to post-operative hypertony and bleeding. The suturing and dissection during scleral wickling becomes very important and heavy prior to be avoided because it might come in just two seconds, unlike adults, um, which will take around eight to 10 seconds. The external muscles are thin and fragile and it should be handled. There is a lot of talk already been done on past planet development. It's generally followed a year of rule, one mm at every year and at four years of age, we can uh, start practicing that normal rate. However, in premature infants, instruments or injections need to, uh, they have to take around 0.5 to 1 mm posterior to the limbus. In this is a case of, of scale buckling, which was uh, in uh, plan for stage four ROP for uh, 240 bending scale, and you can see the uh, very thin muscles. Now, important is that after six to 12 months, you have to remove the buckles, and uh, this is become very crucial because at that point of time, the conjunctiva gets fused with the sclera, and even if you do a certain amount of missed, uh, uh, miss, uh, missed. Uh, uh, surgery and then you can enter the sclera and then cause it the point because the sclera is really thin. We all know that the vitreoretinal interface consists of a strongly adherent cortical hyaloid and we have we are doing a PPV for regmatous RDs or something like that. You have to stay in a stain and keep looking for the cortical vitreous. You can use different instruments like DDMS, finis loop and islands forceps to induce PVD. Then vitreous in ROP and dystrophic eyes is characterized by solid and liquid size and they might give you a false impression of PVD. However, you don't need to completely remove it. Now, the most important is that the perfusion pressure in the pediatric eyes is very low. And if you keep the bottle height, if you have a gravity faced infusion or if you have pressurized infusion, they may it might lead to a hydrogenic CRO. And if you avoid excessive scleral depression or elevated intraocular pressure line, this is a case of a blame like ROP in which I would like to emphasize that point. You can see that both blame is on the top and it is completely a uh, white while it's on beaming. And I raise, decrease the bottle height from 47 to, to, to 10 centimeter. And then you can see the whole of the bleb is reperfused and you can see the bleeders. And I can slightly raise it. And then again, it was completely blanched out. So this is the important that you have to realize that you have to look for the bleeders and it can really, you know, the perfusion pressure is really low. You, now again, we have the, the pediatric instrumentation just begins with the draping itself. Now, the, whenever you do a case, there are a lot of GA pipes uh, which often interfere with the biome and the microscope free there. We are most of us are using the non-contact by viewing synthesizing system and especially the recite system, which tends to be on the posterior side, it will hit it and you can you will not be able to. So you when if you are doing a unilateral surgery, try to orient the pipes that are coming from, from the anesthesia on the other side. Now, visualization, since you are working in a very crowded space and if they are using a non-contact system, it, it can, you know, keep on, keep on hitting it. So you, you, what are the options? You can use a high and magnification lenses like the, the green 60 diopter lens, the recite system, but then it will come with the limitation of the fill, but most of the posterior part you can be able to do, or you can use a small diameter non-disposable biome lens also. I have no experience in, in the ocular pediatric lens vitreous system, which come for the small diameter. Now, uh, a normal, uh, the, uh, these are, if you do a sclerotomy using a normal adult trochanter cannula system, there are high chances of inducing lens trauma due to the upward movement of the lens while you're manipulating or they can cause iatrogenic retinal break if it is anterior approved. There are multiple packs which are uh, uh, customized for pediatric, but then they again come with a cost. The very novel was done by Babu et al. in which they placed a 240 band uh, 2 into 2 mm. Now, you, this is how you do it. You can use a normal uh, 2, 240 man. This decreases the effective length by around 0 0.6 to 0 0.75 mm. You can teach your assistant to do it and they can pre place it before you come and wash in the OT and they can just do it. So, this is a very effective way of decreasing the uh, length, effective length of the trocar cannula. You can close the, regarding the sutures, you can use 8 o vicro sutures or 7 o vicro for doing the sclera and conjunctiva and 14 o vicro sutures. This is another, uh, I have been trying for last four cases in which I use uh, fibrin glue to clue or close the conjunctival peritomy. So the post-op discom post discomfort for the child is less and it is working very fine till now. Uh, I'm worried about if the child rubs, then it might lead to dislodgement. However, it is not till now. Now, the most important part is the informed consent. One of the many exclusions, the findings on the examination under anesthesia can alter the surgical plan. So you go back to the parents, 
tell them about it and you know this and you can also tell them uh, sensitize them that okay before you I will do a you and you might change the plan of action and this is very important uh, regarding the you should uh, generally uh, have stop uh, i mean uh, uh, there is a tendency to give any visual prediction but you should avoid it because you are dealing with a lot of um, Amblyopia component also along with the whole uh, anatomical success rate. And this can be, you know, very, very, uh, uh, it can lead to missed, uh, missed calculations regarding the visual outcome. And you must counsel the patient that the patient will require a long follow-up follow -up with a pediatric ophthalmologist and the rehabilitate long rehabilitation is important. Now, another part is uh, regarding all the imaging and you must examine the both eyes. Many pediatric pathologies are bilateral in nature and fellow eyes can provide important diagnostic clues and examine family members as we have seen in the previous talk and they can give an effective genetic testing. Uh, this is a case of which was an abnormal, a totally normal fundus. But if you do uh, ultraviolet field imaging, we need to give for a, a large area of avascular retina with NVEs. This, uh, and then and again, part is that many of our pediatric patients would not be able to complete examination in the clinical setup. So we do an EO and most probably an EO should always be done in an OT where interventions can be covered out if parents give consent. Another part of the surgery is the bilateral surgery performed. You treat it as two separate eyes and not just a single eye to prevent cross contamination. Proper head positioning, how you deal that uh, generally we do is under the neck, we will place a uh, folded up uh, see, uh, folded up uh, towel so that it elevates the whole uh, neck and you can uh, it gets a better exposure. And we already talked about the conjunctival peritomy and sutures. And we uh, before, if we had done a peritomy, you can just in inject two to three ml of lignocaine, and this will proptose the eye, and then you could have a better access. Um, another is regarding the tu tunnel or beveled cannula. I, uh, we just go for a strain drain trocar approach. And there would going to be retinal force which might be attached to the lens. So you do a IO or scleral indentation before beginning of the surgery, and then you look for a clear approach. And you can go for a temporal approach or nasal approach. Or Doctor, nasal. one minute left. Uh, I would be slightly extending it. Sorry, uh, just accommodate if possible. So in this case, we can see that uh, there is a we try to do it under the microscope and look for the indentation and try to find out the safe area where you can place our cannula. Uh, this is another approach in which we call the right hand approach in which we do a vertical. This right arrow is shows the uh, if it is a left eye, we uh, this MBR goes perpendicular and this goes horizontal to the parallel to the limbus and this is the pre placed figure of it. This helps to get a better closure at the another uh, another part is that you use a fresh ward cannula and don't reuse the cannulas and pre-placed anchor sutures and infusion. And important is that whenever you are using uh, infusion cannula, you get an infusion cannula which has a lock mechanism to prevent slippage during eye manipulation. Uh, the another part is the limb. Um, uh, uh, this is uh, regarding the, if you have an advanced ROP, you can go just go for the limbal based approach. And this can, again, you can use a being uh, recite. This is a recite beam system, and we are using the limbal based approach to do the complete complete the dissection. And the in PPB in pediatric TRD, one of the most important component is to prevent uh, any atrogenic break. And you can, if you are uh, if you are not able to complete the dissection, you can con con uh, you can do abort the dissection for that point, and you can do for a stage surgery in which the detachment settled down smooth. Another part is of the rheumatogenous retinal detachment. We must avoid entering the eyes, young eyes, if possible. And PBR in pediatric eyes that have not been previously vitrectomized tends to be subretinal and subretinal bands offer do not exact subtractional traction. To drain or not to drain is up to us. I mean, I generally avoid draining and uh, just do AC parenthesis. Most of this is taken care by the subretinal fluid is taken by the RP pump. Another part is the thin scleral relative size of the buckle to the eye is much larger. And buckle cut down on removal if the young is child in the day is in the growing age group it has to be done at three to six months of age and an isometry appear releasing from encyclic posterior may be greater in pediatric population and uh, another component is to be uh, in the pediatric RIT is, is to for restrain and restrain to look for the cortical vitreous this is a case in which uh, we can just want to demonstrate that uh, how important is to go and look out for the cortical heart uh, cortical vitreous now in this case we think that this is almost done but uh, we use a diamond duster scraper and then you uh, want to induce a peripapillary detachment of the PVD and then we extend this PVD by using our uh, ILM forcep and then we put a bubble of PFL which acts as a counter traction and then we can extend it further to the periphery by using either the alternate suction mechanism of the cutter 
and we are able to do a complete detachment. Another part is uh, we don't need to create additional uh, retinotomies to like in this case of coloma in which they break in the intercalary membrane and we can just go and drain it to the intercalary membrane and not do an additional retinotomy, which we should avoid. Uh, regarding the tamponade, we, we should avoid a tamponade if can run be about it. And you should, uh, we can give for 10% um, CTF rate versus 14% of adult doses. And if you are using a nitrous oxide anesthesia to be avoided, since it can be called unexpected expansion. And you can tag the child by using a bracelet. Um, and do look out for syndromes like this is a case of a bilateral aniridia with cataract with end stage RD. Now, this case, um, uh, once we were suspecting a case of FEVR, we had already done a complete, uh, uh, we had given a 240 band support along with a broad buckle support at the at this area. However, uh, in this case, uh, despite all of our efforts, we, since, we, since it was in a case of aniridia, we also had to give uh, silicon oil retention sutures in order to retain the silicon oil. Another case of again Fildringer syndrome with GRT. And uh, what was unexpected in that, in, in this uh, GRT, generally we expect a complete PVD, but in this, uh, we go went and looked out for the cortical vitreous and we could find out that the cortical vitreous is still there, which is unlike many of the GRTs. And uh, we could do, another, uh, and the most important is uh, not, we all don't need to enter all the eyes uh, in uh, in a case of pediatric we in this case we did a posterior draining sclerotomy uh, and we continued to uh, we did a scale cut down and after that we just increased the IOP and most of this uh, uh, this cholesterol laden uh, subretinal fluid could come out uh, and once we have done uh, most of the fluid was drained intraoperatively itself we went inside under a sanitary illumination we did the peripheral cryo. And this is the first day post-op picture. So to conclude, bilateral eye examination, examination and anesthesia, examination of family members, USG and ultraviolet file imaging go in a long way in managing pediatric retinal disorders. Give parents realistic visual expectation, risk of anesthesia, and this is very important. And long-term rehabilitation of, with a pediatric ophthalmologist. Tame the temptation to jump in pediatric ERDs. If available, do a give us it as a first thought. Meticulous removal of cortical vitreous is important in RRDs. Pediatric TRDs leave the traction position and have faith on the RP pump. And do look out for retinoblastoma. It is a great mimicker. And the most important pearl is that less is more in pediatric VR surgery. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the marathon, sir. Uh, I think uh, doing a lot of good work in Patna. Uh, uh, congratulations on that. Uh, uh, actually, I want to take uh, comments from the stalwarts uh, who have actually published a lot of uh, uh, data on these things. Uh, yes, sir, uh, on the closing note, you were talking about uh, the Coates disease. Uh, my sir has uh, actually uh, published the, the prognostic, uh, poor prognostic factors in, uh, in uh, Coates disease, uh, multiple of them, the advice of uh, more than stage. Uh, 3B and above on the, on the diffusion involvement and uh, vitroretinal fibrosis and as well. Sir, uh, why, sir how do you uh, manage, uh, how do you, uh, what are the first three steps you would uh, like to do in uh, salvaging the globe, which you have uh, published in your paper as 92%, which is very difficult to manage in our cases. Uh, in Coates disease, like in whatever the stage may be, I would prefer to treat to see if you can salvage the globe. So initially is to attach the retina and do the laser photocoagulation and intravital steroids or something which really helps. So drain and the draining the fluid, Dr. Abhishek had a, a beautiful lecture on uh, like he pretty much covered almost everything as far as the pediatric retinal surgery is concerned. But what I would do is to do, do a simple approach of using a two needle technique. So I use a 26 gauge needle with the plunger removed go deep into the cul-de-sac, right in the area of the bullous retinal attachment and enter this and enter the subretinal space kind of blindly. And then inject with the 30 gauge needle and 2 cc syringe between the folds of the retina in the superior quadrant. And as we inject, the, the subretinal fluid drains out and the retina reattaches. And once it reattaches, the laser photocoagulation or, or all the vascular malformations and intervital steroids is what I do. Cryo mm -hmm. is something I have given up. And uh, because cryo, because there can be mounds of exudation in the periphery, and the cryo takes a long time for the uh, to travel from the sclera into the uh, retina, and uh, we may be over cryoing it. So I prefer to do laser photocoagulation. 
So these should be the steps which I use. Drain the fluid, then focus on the treating all the vascular malformations and the intermittent steroids. It could be time alone or dexamethasone does work quite well. And contrast to anti vegf anti vegf in my hands don't seem to work as good as uh, intermittent steroids. Sir, uh, Gopal, sir, uh, me, I'm yeah, I think the principles are exactly the same, but my technique will be a little different. I prefer to put an infusion cannula, although I'm not going to do vitrectomy. I use a chandelier. And under direct visualization, although I'm not doing vitrectomy, I put a needle from behind at the subretting space. You can actually see the needle in the subretting space. And while somebody is actively sucking the subretting fluid, the infusion is going. So the eye is never soft. Okay, if the eye is allowed to be soft, two things can happen. One, of course, the needle can slip out. And two, bleeding can occur in the subretting space. And so I don't want to happen, that to happen. And also, I'm using the same infusion port. I can go with endolaser probe now. Even if there's a shallow RD, I can treat directly each one of these vascular lesions under the chandelier illumination. So I directly treat them. So I don't use cryo, as Mahesh said. And postoperatively, also, if there's a residual fluid and you're retreating by using the indirect laser and directly focusing on these red lesions, even with the retina elevated, you can actually blanch them and treat them well. So try to avoid cryo as soon as, as far as possible. But first drainage is what I would do. I put a chandelier, I put an infusion cannula, and drain from outside without retracting. Yeah. I, I think, sir, uh, what I tried to do was I tried to do laser with LIO rather than going inside. And that is the mistake that I And it was not coming, and that is why I needed to do cryo. I think I tried LIO, but uh, I think that is the better way to go for with an endolaser when you have already introduced the chandelier, I think. I would agree with Dr. Gopal. Only thing is, like, if the retina is right behind the ledge, it becomes difficult to put a chandelier or the infusion cannula. So, in that situation, initial part, like, what we can do is to drain a little bit and then inject with a needle, push the retina a little bit down so that there is sufficient space for us to put the proper cannula and go ahead. And as far as the LIO is concerned, like, we're not looking for laser photocoagulation burns, like how we would look at in any other case, because the R it's not in contact with the RPE. So, you don't see a retinal burn. So what you're treating is only the vascular malformations. So we have to treat the uh, vascular malformations which blanch out. So it should become white or black. So you don't get laser photocoagulation marks like how we would get in any other uh, retinal disease. That's the, that's the key. So but I, I also do I also do like what Dr. LG mentioned, like put the trocar cannula or put sclerotomies, go inside and do endolaser without doing a vitrectomy. If you're not too aggressive in moving your probe inside, you're not disturbing the vitreous so much to create a little break. So it's okay to go inside and do focal laser photocoagulation uh, with the endolaser probe as well. Sir, do you do also do by endolaser or by uh, LIO, sir? Uh, I have now doing more with endolaser because like you don't have to get up and put on the direct, but then like either of them, but subsequent follow-up visits when I don't have to drain the fluid, I would do is LIO. If I have to drain the fluid, then I would probably use a, 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 a endolaser. Okay. Shall we go on to our next speaker? Yes, so we have Dr. Subhadra Jalali who have um, already introduced you, Dr. Subhadra, and I don't think you need any introduction at all. An amazing person and we look forward to hearing from you on surgical pearls and ROP surgeries. Uh, on to you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. My hand is raised, but I am not able to lower it, but just ignore it. And uh, thank you so much. I thought I wouldn't be able to present because <laughs> there was some problem with the computer, but all your good wishes and love, it's come back alive. <laughs> so let's go. So I'm going to talk about sclera imbrication. And it's such a great pleasure to present in front of my teachers. Uh, so I wanted to report about this uh, surgical technique that I'm using for ROP surgeries um, in case of the patient presenting with more complex detachments rather than just like a stage four or five, which we already heard um, what to do in those cases. So there's just some data, but more I wanted to tell about the technique. So I have been struggling for almost 20 years with cases like this, who, you know, they seem to be stable and then suddenly they come back with very weird looking detachments. There are folds, there's thinning of the retina, as you see. Then there's exudation, then there's traction somewhere and break somewhere in the periphery, which you can't see. 
And really the approach used to be to put a belt buckle, do vitrectomy, do lensectomy, uh, remove all these membranes by, man by manual dissection, try to open some of the folds, if not all. And while we are doing that PBD or trying to do a partial PBD because we don't want to create a full PBD, we would create a lot of breaks and then we would put oil in that child and then remove the oil and then go back for second surgery, third surgery, and then, you know, dabble with the corneal problems, glaucoma, thysis. So it used to be a continuous uh, return to OT multiple times for many of these cases. And still every next surgery would lead to less and less outcomes. And this was very frustrating. So in one of the meetings, I was discussing with Dr. Gopal and I said, like, you know, what do you do? So he said that I do a scleral imbrication. So I had never seen this. I didn't know how to do it. So I just thought that, okay, let me see the literature and how they are doing. And I did some case and then I wrote to, um, again, in the meeting, I told Dr. Gopal and Mahesh Shanmugam that this is what I have done. Then they sent me a video and uh, that gave me a lot of encouragement and had a lot of time during the COVID time. So I started doing more and more of these complex cases. Now done almost more than 50 cases and I'm so happy that single technique is helping me to uh, take care of these patients. So this is what the literature talked about. Uh, this is from, uh, you know, publication in 1959. So I know that, you know, the old gets lost somewhere as we get new techniques. And this is what they did. They did a cut down of the sclera and tied it tightly so that the globe became flat in one area. So what I thought was that if I make it like this, then under the muscle, I'm not able to do that imbrication. So it will be only in the quadrants and not under the muscle. So what if the break is under the muscle or the more traction is under the muscle and I can't see it? So I did two modifications. One, instead of the spindle, I started making squares, uh, which I will show in the video. And uh, second, I started putting a buckle on that because when I tighten in one quadrant, the, ret the sclera and the retina start bulging in the other quadrant that is under the muscle where it is weak and where we are not putting any imbrication. So uh, previously, literature didn't talk about combined buckle and uh, imbrication. So I thought that putting both the things together would possibly make it more likely to succeed than if we do only buckle or only imbrication. So in recent years, people have tried to do imbrications uh, without dissection also in some of the myopic skysis, but there has not been reported for you know the combined detachments that we are talking about. <clears throat> After tagging the muscles and clearing the sphere of all the tenons, a horizontal incision is given at the site where the... Can you hear the audio? Is yes. yes. Can be anterior posterior to it. And then I give two vertical incisions on the sides. Create two flaps up and down. And then uh, suture these with non-absorbable 5O ethibond or 5O decron sutures and make it very tight. So I was surprised that when we make the flaps, the globe becomes very soft. You know, we realize how much strength the sclera is giving to that pressure of the globe. I thought I won't be able to tighten it. But, you know, it was really surprising to me that uh, even without paracentesis, although I do paracentesis or drainage in many cases where there's a lot of fluid, uh, I was able to, you know, oppose these sutures. And now, of course, I hold the knot and pull it more and more and then it can really become tight. But as you see, as we are tightening in the center, the sides are bulging. And then we cannot cover that with the imbrication. So that is why One I is decided tight, to put the buckle. You can put on the buckle or you can, you know, drain it. And also, I always do a paracentesis in these eyes to make it soft so that the buckle height and the imbrication can be achieved to the extent that we want. So if there's enough fluid, then I will drain. Here I'm draining uh, after making a cut down, but various ways you can drain. You can use a 26 gauge needle, which is my preferred way of draining. Uh, this patient this I opened. Done in one or more quadrants, the minimum quadrants I have done is two quadrants and the maximum I have done is all four quadrants. In the initial phase, I used to remove the scleral um, flaps, but lately I have been putting it back and then suturing it. Uh, the contentious points could be whether the buckle will intrude or the sutures will intrude or whether there will be any uh, ischemic necrosis. Uh, so far has not happened. 
So why uh, the buckle will not intrude is because actually we are strengthening the sclera. We are making the flaps and then we are putting the buckle over those flaps. Unlike the old times when we were doing the implants where we used to make the flaps and then put the flaps over the buckle and so the buckle was likely to intrude. So in one of the cases, I had an opportunity to repeat the surgery after two years. So for two years, she did well and then she came back with a new detachment. And again, I didn't want to do a vitrectomy. So I just did a repeat imbrication with a larger buckle. And at that time, I you know, was sort of curious to know what happened to that site. So it was nice to know that that whole thing had scarred and the sclera had become Ma'am, we lost you. Yeah. What do we do? Can you call her? Uh, if she'll be already waiting no, for someone to get help, if I call her. Yeah, uh, that'd be. Thank yeah. you for that. Uh, we missed uh, the last uh, few, one minute of your talk. Okay, can you hear now? Yeah. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, so I said that the complications uh, so far, only thing which has happened is the raised pressure. Uh, they have raised pressure for a few months and they need anti glaucoma medication. But by six months to one year, almost all of them uh, were off all medication. So we need to follow. And other thing I learned was that, you know, in some of these patients, especially if it is FEVR, once the retina attaches, we should do a very thorough laser of all the avascular retina. Otherwise, the disease, of course, can come back. And I lost one eye to that uh, because I didn't realize that. I was so happy that the retina is attached and I had done cryo to the lesion, but I had not lasered the peripheral retina. So most of these patients uh, got back the vision that they are expected to get. And uh, I'm following them. Now it's more than three and a half years. And except for two patients, uh, all of them are doing well. So, uh, you know, here you can see the same patient after surgery. What it does is it makes the, you know, uh, buckle really high and the globe shortened so the traction component and the red component both are taken care of the vascular component we need to do laser uh, for that lesions whichever are there so in very complicated cases like this where you can see this was an afeki kai after stage 4b surgery in childhood in uh, infancy then came back at you know 11 months of age he had a first surgery and now at four years he comes back in his only eye that he stopped playing and it was even difficult to see whether there is a reg RD. But Doctor, one on minute the left. Skin. Yeah, yeah, I'm just closing. And then the same surgery we did and retina was well attached. So this is another patient where there was no reg RD, but it was a fold of retina with little active uh, ROP. And here again, I didn't want to do a lensectomy. And having put the uh, sclera imbrication, you can see how even the fold opened. And how that happens is that you are pressing the globe all, all around. So just the bottom will flatten. And you can see here, I didn't even need to do anything and patient is doing quite well. Again, a very complicated looking uh, retina with very thin avascular periphery, post ROP, uh, psychiatric ROP. Same surgery done in all four quadrants and child got 20-50 vision. The refraction, of course, can change to myopia from minus 7, it became minus 11. So I'm just uh, not a new surgery. So many people have already done it, but I've just tried to, uh, you know, do something different and uh, I'm so happy with this surgery because a single surgery was able to cure a large number of people where I would have, you know, been frustrated with multiple surgeries. Amazing. Truly really amazing. I'm so glad I'm in this webinar today to hear you. You're going to do it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Ma'am, uh, uh, of course, we have been your students uh, for a very long. Uh, just uh, being uh, out of naivety or ignorance, Ma'am, is imbrication is truly superior to buckle or in combination with buckle it works well or uh, uh, in those folds where you need the extra um, position uh, imbrication is the only uh, way to go because uh, because the uh, sphere gets shortened and uh, yeah so you? dr gopal and mahesh they have done imbrication without buckles and they vouch of course we believe that it works uh, but my only thought is that, you know, if it doesn't work and I'm just putting a buckle because that will sort of add if there's a break. And usually these reg RDs in the setting of uh, uh, tractional RDs, they follow still, they follow the Linkoff's rule. So you can have a pretty good idea where the likely break is. And, you know, you can search for that break. You may or may not find it, can cryo that area. 
and I try to because a lot of times these are anterior breaks we can't see them within the folds or they're at the base of the fold so it only that it you know reinforces that area and as I said the surrounding areas are also covered so the chance of it not working very well would become little less but I mean Dr. Gopal is here and Mahesh they have much more uh, you know experience with doing imbrication so I think they are the best people to teach us. The only point I would like to make is that basically imbrication is an extension of the technique of implant which we used to do in the past. Except we don't put a buckle but close the scleral flaps. But the only point I would like to make is that even under the muzzle you can dissect. It's not that you have to make it only between between the muzzles and under the muzzle you leave it untouched. If we have to go 180 degrees, you dissect the same dissection, extend it under the muzzle like what we used to do the implant technique. You dissect it from both sides and meet them in the center. And you can pass the suture even there. So basically, it can be an extension of the same thing all around, about 180 degrees. Usually, we avoid more, more than 220 degrees because if you bend both the long ciliary vessels, the risk of ischemia becomes more. And when you imbricate, you actually are trying to fold the entire inner wall other than the sclera into a sharp fold, which is protruding inside the eye. So the long ciliary vessels can get really damaged there. So if you uh, hurt both long ciliary vessels on both sides, there is a risk of um, anti-segment ischemia. So you don't like to go more than 180 to 200 degrees of an imbrication. So as you said very rightly, the site where you want to do, you place it and you can add a buckle. There's nothing wrong in adding a buckle on top of it. But in some cases where you think it is not required, you don't have to, have to add an extra buckle. And in most cases where I put, I just put a 276, not even a 279, beyond that because you already shortened the sclera, the 276 itself reaches quite far beyond the equator in that quadrant. So it works as well as uh, any large buckle. So, yeah. so in, infants, yeah. in infants, yeah. I put 240 or 42, like very small. Yeah, that should be also 240, enough. 240, it's enough. enough. Yeah. Older children, maybe 287, yeah. most of the time. So 276 and 287 are almost yeah. But the other point I would like to say is where the sclera is very thin and you're worried that tightening the suture can cut through, the technique we again we used to adopt in the implant days is to place a uh, four zero chromic cat gut uh, between the two loops so that it doesn't allow it to cut through. So that's what the technique we used to do for scleral flaps. Same technique you can follow, but again, serial paracentesis and slowly, slowly tightening it should be able to approximate it pretty well in most cases. Thank you. Yeah, that technique I learned from Dr. Das. We put any suture in between. Actually, we put the five zero only. <laughs> we don't get a cat gut, and it will act as a splint. Mahesh, you want to add anything? So what are the yeah, complications sure. you've seen and have you seen any major issues and what do you think is the success rate? Uh, I haven't. Uh, my indications are uh, kind of different from what uh, you have been showing, Dr. Uh, Subhadra. And of course, uh, Dr. Gopal was there who has very elegantly told us what to do. And what I do is to actually, like Dr. Gopal said, like you fold the sclera inside to create a buckle effect inside. But then like my indication is usually if there's a transform fold and the extreme periphery temporarily there's a fibrous tissue, which is pulling up the retina and causing the falciform fold. And the, the only way we can relieve the falciform fold is to, as you said very rightly, to cut the retina and doing retinectomy, which is probably, uh, but like kind of it results in a very aggressive form of a recurrence and detachment. In that situation, what I would do is to shorten the sclera. So when I shorten the sclera, then that scar tissue which is pulling up the retina is kind of relaxed. So the transform fold goes down. But in a combined recognized retinal attachment uh, with the tracking attachment like Dr. Kopal uh, uh, mentioned, I would also use only a buckle and not an imbrication. I don't fold the sclera inside, but like my indication is to relax the transform fold. So I pull the sclera outside and then excess the, excess the fold so that shorten the sclera. One other thing I found is like in the initial phases you know, of the surgery, the child's eye looks a little bit uh, distorted, but then subsequently the astigmatism is also seems to be higher, but then it kind of settles down over the years. And uh, I would usually uh, go across the lateral rectus because usually I am dealing with the, the temporal retina. So like Dr. LG mentioned, uh, you take the dissection under the lateral rectus on either side create the flap and take the sutures. So, and usually it's more than about three to four clock hours is the uh, area of the imbrication which I would do. That's the that's the one which kind of gives the reasonable amount of shortening of the temple sclera. Yeah. Otherwise, very elegantly shown, Dr. Subhadra. Great. I think, uh, you know, uh, all of us should try to do this. Uh, it's uh, those who have done implants before, like myself, 
it was a little easier, but people are making flaps for SICS, for other things, for traps. So it's something which we are familiar with. We don't need any extra instrumentation. Uh, everything is on the trolley itself. So I think it's a good armamentarium in our complicated cases. Uh, I want to yeah, Subhadra, you are you are putting uh, you are doing the imbrication and also doing the buckling. I just wondered whether uh, um, doing buckling alone could have given you the same result. You know, use a so large... you know that you know in these complicated detachments of regmatogenous where you don't know where the break is and sometimes there's PBR or may not be PBR and you have no idea like there's exudation. So it's like a triple whammy. Uh, sometimes the buckle alone doesn't work. If we can see the break and it's a very simple detachment, then it may work. But still, because of that fold and that traction ongoing, and if you are going to do cryo to that break in a situation where you are not going to remove the vitreous, you know, the chances of re-detachment become higher. We know that complicated detachment, buckle surgery may give you 50 to 60% uh, chance of reattachment. But when you do this, then your chance of reattachment goes up to 80-90%, which is same as buckle alone for non-complicated detachments. You know, so your your chances of failure become, I think, less. Thank you, thank you. I think you have drawn attention to a very old technique. You know, like an old technique rediscovered. So definitely, it's uh, worth trying in some complicated. Old wine is always better. Yes, <laughs> yes. Old <Paul> teachers also. <laughs> thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Doctor Subhadra. I really enjoyed your talk and. Uh, we, we shall now go on to our keynote speaker, Dr. Lingam Gopal, who's going to be telling us about surgical pearls in pediatric Hello. Yes? Yes? You can't hear me? Uh, no, ma'am. You continue. Uh, Dr. Abhishek has some uh, technical glitch. You okay. continue. So we look forward to hearing the surgical pearls on uh, pediatric uh, legmatogenous retinal detachment. On to you, Dr. Gopal. Uh, are you able to see my slides? Yeah, yes. Yes, yes. yeah I think uh, to start with, I would like to remove the word pearls because what I'm talking are just random points. I know very little about jewelry, so I thought I'm restricted to calling it as random points. And these are really, really random. And I that's why I really requested whether I can avoid talking and just trying to summarize at the end. But since they asked me to talk, these are random points. So anywhere I can stop, because there's no continuous story that I'm going to build up. Uh, we all know that, that there's a large list of causes for pediatric regmatogenous and non-regmatogenous retinal detachment. And if I have to cover all of them, obviously, it's not going to be possible in this short time. So what are the issues that are relevant to a pediatric age group? Is the difficulty in evaluating in the clinic, difficulty in assessing their vision, the need for frequent GA, sedation, etc., and not uncommon bilaterality of the disease, and of course, a late presentation because many children don't complain to the parents and they notice this accidentally when the fellow eye also is affected or when they go to school and the school teacher finds for the first time there's a problem with vision. And of course, there are emotional factors associated with this problem wherein the, there are high expectations from the parents who expect a ROP stage 5 child to go to a normal school after your surgery. And the outpatient issues uh, and how we can manage of course, mummifying and speculum evaluation, we all are aware of on how to examine babies with ROP. But the flying baby optospotography can sometimes come in handy wherein the child is, uh, you're not able to get a good view of the fundus and not even know whether the retina is in the central portion visible or not. Optospotography can sometimes give you a better view than what you can yourself examine the baby with, even through your small pupil. And again, one trick when you examine the baby is wait for the eye to roll towards you rather than trying to chase the eye. That is, sometime or other, the baby's eye will come towards you and you can get a glimpse of the retina and have an assessment at least to decide on what to do next. And we examine again the baby's eye, as well in the coloboma size, I found that people have missed shallow RDs beyond the coloboma, but the what you need to concentrate upon is the choroidal pattern. The choroidal vascular pattern suddenly changes in the area with shallow RD. And when you have a doubt, you can always confirm with an ultrasound which clearly shows you the shallow elevated detachment. Patience, of course, gives you a lot of uh, value in trying to evaluate these children with uh, shallow detachment, which can be easily missed. And if you are in doubt, in a small people, you can use a 30 adapter lens. But I prefer to still use a 20 adapter lens because 
it gives me a better concept or a better idea about what is happening in the eye. With the 30 adapter lens, the immediately minimized view makes it sometimes difficult for me to understand what is happening. But some people really prefer to use 30 adapter lens because you can see a larger field at the same time. Coming to pediatric RRD versus scleral buckling, why is it that we prefer to do scleral buckling rather than a vitrectomy in a pediatric age group? Number one, there is no posterior vitreous detachment. And a PPV approach in some of these eyes may end up in doing the relaxing retinotomy and oil in many of the cases with the contracted retina. The lens can be preserved in, with a buckle both during surgery and after surgery, and hence the visual rehabilitation is faster. But the issues with buckling is the dwindling experience. There's a low threshold to convert to vitrectomy, especially in the West, where people have really stopped doing scleral buckling in the adults. There's a mortal fear for placing posterior buckles. I have recently done a buckle in a, in a child, in a 14 year old girl in Singapore, who has been advised vitrectomy with silicone oil by four other surgeons. And with just a simple buckle, the child is doing very well with 6 6 vision with no other problem. It's a Macaulay case, and still they have advised vitrectomy with silicone oil. While what he needed, she needed is just a 279 buckle, which is placed a little posteriorly. So there's a mortal fear for placing posterior buckle in these patients uh, in, in this era. Now, why external SRF drainage can be tricky in a pediatric RD? Again, with the lattice degeneration with a chronic RD, you find the fluid can become very, very thick. And even a shallow RD should be drained in these cases because you're not really opposing the hole to the buckle if you don't drain even a shallow RD. When the fluid is very thick and you may end up with actually cryoing agreed but the retina will atrophy independent of the rpe and you don't get an adhesion between the two and if you don't put encephalage thinking that it's a small focal area then you may actually end up with a buckle which becomes shallow very fast and hence does not cause a position of the rpe to the retina and hence even in a shallow rd i would like to drain if it's a very very chronic rd because you have what they call as elevated blister effect the whole RD gets lifted up to the buckle rather than approximating the RPE to the retina. Local, if when you drain also, if the local evacuation of the SRF takes place quickly, like a blob of it is, it will come out. And then the rest of the SRF gets trapped elsewhere and you have the same problem, especially if you are drained away from the brake, which is what we often do. So what we should do is try to squeeze the fluid towards the drainage site, even before the fluid right over the drainage site gets drained out totally. This way you can at least squeeze out most of the thick fluid and hence at least approximate the break to the uh, buckle so that the rest of the fluid can take its own time to get absorbed. There is also a trick in a sort of drainage in dialysis, dialysis with RD where the vitreous is still intact but there is a pocket of residual liquefied vitreous over the dialysis. So if you drain very close to the dialysis, you end up draining the liquid vitreous but not the subretinal fluid. So you should drain as far away from the dialysis as possible. Number two, when you're actually trying to drain, you can try to approximate the dialysis to the RPE by putting a cotton tip replicator so that you temporarily cut off the communication between the liquid vitreous and the dialysis, allowing the subretinal fluid to come out rather than the intravitreal fluid to come out. And very often post buckling, you'll find residual fluid. You can confirm the closed status of the retinal break. And once the year know it is closed, just don't worry about the residual fluid. You can follow up on serial OCTs and you'll find over a period of six to eight months, it will get dried up. Now, why anti-segment approach may be better than ROP and anti-PHPV? Extreme anterior loop tractions, the retina can actually come in the path of the entry wounds, as we elegantly shown in some of the presentations before. But at Rabbi Sheikh, that the uh, the the can actually go to the yes, you can always inspect the periphery and choose a location where the the invasion color can still be placed to the past placata. But when in doubt, best is to go through the anti segment route. And I don't mind uh, removing the iris, but I mean I don't want to remove the iris in these cases. Even if I go through the anterior segment route, I would rather put iris hooks and retract the iris as far into the periphery as possible, not four, maybe even six hooks, so that it's almost like the iris is not there and allows you to operate very freely right up to the periphery. The presence of parsimony epithelial detachment is again a common problem. Sometimes you would have found that the first entry with the MVR bread, even at 1.5 millimeters from the rimbus, you'll find the yellow fluid coming out, telling you that 
you actually went into subretinal space. Here it's not subretinal, but it's subretinal space extending into the subparsplenic epithelial space because the parsplenic epithelium is detached. This also you can avoid by going to the antisegment route. There's also grossly inward, inwardly displaced ciliary processes, which makes it extremely difficult to place an infusion cannula properly. So any PHPV, especially anterior PHPV, should go through the antisegment route and cut the tissue attached to the ciliary process. You'll find right in front of your eyes, the whole ciliary body is going to fall backwards. Which cases of ROP are amenable for scleral buckling? The predominantly peripheral little detachment, which is mostly seen in eyes that have never had laser, and mostly seen in eyes with the anterior zone two that perhaps has been missed and not treated properly at the appropriate time. These are the RDs which do benefit by a scleral buckling technique, where you sort of stabilize the disease by the cryopexy and the buckle, and over time, the uh, peripheral traction also gets reduced, although there will always be some residual traction in these eyes, and you can still remove the buckle without the risk of recurrence of RD, provided there is no other issue. Or there's a predominantly exudative RD, which occasionally you can see, I probably had an opportunity to do a buckle in an ROP in maybe four or five cases where there's an exudative component is much more than fibrotic component. So you can put a buckle and drain the fluid like any other sterile buckling process that you perform and they can do extremely well. The significance of the configuration of the RD in ROP is that tight funnels indicate extremely contracted retina. They're least likely to succeed because there's not enough retina left to oppose to the retinal pigment epithelium. So despite your extreme dissection, you'll find still behind, you're left with a tube of retina extending from the disc all the way to the mid-periphery of the equatorial level, then you know that the eye is not going to do well. Likewise, if there's a highly elevated, sharp retinal fold, you should understand that the rest of the retina has been stretched so much to be able to provide retina to form this sharp retinal fold. So that has less visual competence. A broad, deep peripheral trough is easier to dissect because you've got enough space between the ciliary process and the ridge to introduce your scissors and cut without risk of causing a oral dialysis or an artery that will break. And there you can actually relieve the traction very well. If there's an open funnel posteriorly, I think that's more important than an open funnel anteriorly. You can very much open an anteriorly closed, relatively closed funnel or open funnel very easily, equally easily, but a posteriorly open funnel is much more easily openable than posteriorly closed funnel. So a posteriorly open funnel has got a higher success rate once you have even a relatively closed anterior funnel. There are cases where you have a subretinal space which is under tension. You find that you have got no space to dissect. The retina keeps bulging forwards and you are not able to dissect properly at all. In these cases, there's less space for dissection. So you do a needle drainage, suck out some amount of fluid, and then if you inject a little viscoelastic, you'll find that you have created a space for dissection. This is mostly seen when there's a lot of altered blood in subretinal space. Now, false form folds, I would differentiate between a fully developed false form fold and a developing false form fold. If there's a developing false form fold, it's like a tent. There you can still have an opportunity for the retina to flatten out if you relieve the traction at appropriate time without sacrificing the lens. But if there's a fully developed form fold wherein the retina retinal sinecase occurred right from the RP level all the way to anteriorly, it's unlikely any surgery would help that eye. It's best that you leave it alone because the rest of the retina, although it's stretched, can still have visual function rather than making the eye unnecessarily fake because without okay. sacrificing One the lens, left. Can't the traction. Okay, okay. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, why most ROPs, RDs are not amenable for exchange. Fluid gas exchange is because retina is force shortened and stiff. The forceful attempts to reattach the retina using FGE will not succeed and tear the retina apart. So you should only try to relieve traction, let the retina stretch itself postoperatively over a period of time. And that allows the retina to stretch and oppose to RPE rather than you forcing it on the table. And if there's no time left, I will probably skip the rest of the slides. Uh, Dr. Chitra, you would like me to okay. I can leave it for this discussion. How many more slides? Uh, I think we'll hear you. All right. Uh, this is why does ROP, which has been managed, lead to RD? In 
post stage 5 rop surgery a progressive stretching of the retina which leads to macular holes and peripheral holes as eyeball increases in size in post stage 4 rop residual fibrosis leads to breaks at the edge of the laser area or within the laser area and in eyes with false form fold very often you get a break right at the near the ora serrata so even a simple buckle sometimes can work there because you close that peripheral break but that's where imbrication technique can help very well because you actually fold that in the retina the sclera um, i think i'll probably skip this what causes an rd recurrent rd in colobometasis because of poor choice of surgery scleral buckling being done and what you needed is a vitreoretinal surgery inability to induce pvd is the most common cause of failure of surgery incomplete laser around the coloboma because of a tot icm which especially in the area of communication between subretinal and sub icm space not connecting the laser around the coloboma to the ora serrata and is unprotected peripheral retina near the ora serrata if pvr is present pre operatively of course it's outside anybody's control but post operative pvr when to start with there was no pvr is mostly caused by as iatrogenic because of a improperly done surgery and not inability to induce a pvd and doing a good proper dissection why buckles fail in skies related rds the most clinically visible rd breaks are not the cause of rd the breaks are usually present near the posterior edge of the skies which can be seen very often only during surgery when you actually excise the inner layer and fold it up you can see the break right in the posterior edge of the skies and persistent traction with the tot inner layer can be a cause for the recurrent rd if you try to do a buckle post open globe injury in the situation most zone 3 injuries and some zone 2 injuries would require early intervention the benefits of pass plan vitreoretinal may outweigh the risks multifold and hence you try to don't try to hedge don't try to postpone the intervention in eyes with zone 3 injuries because if you do good vitreoretinal and correct the situation you will avoid retinal detachment occurring post operatively procrastination is a cause for rd causing severe pvr ending up with this degree retinotomy etc while what you all needed was a good vitreoretinal and a bulk buckle it would have saved the situation 10 to 20 days is the ideal window of opportunity and iol mindedness should not be the driving force for managing these eyes at this i'll skip in conclusion rd in pediatric gauge group is a mixed bag approach to management is dictated by not only the disease process age of presentation fellow status and estimation of the probable vision pre operative evaluation can be tricky and needs multiple approaches to understand what is happening being aggressive can be useful in some but it could be counterproductive in others like in stage uh, stage 4 rops where you could not be too aggressive remember your interaction involves not just the patient but his or her parents as often grandparents and it's best to involve them right from the stage of decision making and do not forget siblings as repeated distrust thank you very much for your attention thank you thank you very much doctor i'm sorry if it was such a oh, no. uh, unconnected no. uh, slides because my topic made me to talk like that thank you very much for your attention yeah. sir uh, uh, it's a privilege uh, to uh, hear all these things from you uh, actually uh, the last uh, the two slides before the conclusion the coloboma rd sir so uh, i was fortunate to see one of your post ops in my fellowship uh, 10 years ago in lpi we had come to operate so i just want to ask in the era of this new age uh, discovery of uh, pneumatic retinopexy in 1998 you uh, my sir have all published one uh, cases of uh, 85 cases of uh, coloboma rd out of which uh, 80 cases of uh, used silicon oil and five cases we had uh, um, put uh, gas in uh, out of these 80 cases 16.16.3 point, cases had recurrence and in uh, those five cases we had uh, almost 60% recurrence with the improvement in instrumentation or uh, uh, in the, this today's age would you still stick to the same uh, result what you had published 25 years ago or you would uh, uh, say that uh, uh, now with a better vitreoretinal we can do uh, use a better tamponing uh, i would say that tamponing is what you choose is different from the improvements in vitreoretinal techniques is we improved in our uh, in the techniques in sense you got wide angle systems and 20 gauge has come down to 25 gauge but the basic techniques have remained the same 
even when we did not have wide angle system, we were effectively, effectively doing wide angle surgery because we were using a lander lens with a prism and going all the way up to the periphery. So we did not compromise on the peripheral vitrectomy. And we were inducing PVD in all the cases. So if you're able to induce PVD without traumatically, I mean, if your induction of PVD is not traumatic, in the sense you are, don't have to violently induce PVD, then you can actually restrict the amount of tamponading to a gas as long as you know exactly where the communication between the subretinal space and subisim space is. Very often it is located somewhere near the disc and posterior pole, and hence a good C3 F8 gas should succeed. But where you are not sure about that, and where you have to really violently induce PVD, sometimes you can create additional foresight of communication between subretinal and subisim space more than what was originally present, and hence covering the entire colobomatous margin with a tamponading agent helps. And in a child where posturing can become a real problem, silicon oil obviously is more useful. And in a single-eyed person or where one eye is extremely microphthalmic, which is not uncommon, again, oil helps in early rehabilitation. So there are more reasons than one why use oil, not just because a, ga a gas cannot work, but because oil can give them early rehabilitation. And then you are also more sure of what is happening. And if you need to add additional laser postoperatively before you remove the oil, you can do that. So basically, for many reasons, we use oil. But as you said, can you use gas? Yes, definitely you can use gas in selected cases as long as you're able to choose correctly. Maybe if you don't choose correctly, you'll have high recurrence rate if you use gas. I think in that series, it was not just pediatric. I think it was adult also. Is that right? Ashray? I don't remember. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, yes, sir. I think in children, generally, gas cannot really work. I mean, you know, the age group, inability to position yourself and the pathology and the rapid PVR that, you know, most often these eyes are prone to. I mean, I, I, I really rarely use gas in a pediatric age group. It's almost always, you know, silicon oil when we are doing a tamponade. We end up using silicon oil in, in these eyes. In the other thing is that if you put gas, no, then I think the amblyopia would be higher because that gas will remain for such a long time. In many cases where I put oil, because I'm not putting gas, I remove the oil in two, three weeks. You know, if the retina is nicely attached, your laser has worked well, you don't need to keep it for a long time. The earliest I have removed is 10 days. Uh, this was a child from Nigeria, came with Skysis and RD. The surgery went off very well. And they had to go back and we knew there's nobody there to remove it. So we removed and now it's five years, he's fine. So, you know, but if we put gas, then I think the amblyopia would be much more uh, because the gas will not go for a long time. At least oil, if you're not removing, at least you can give the correction also. Uh, sir, my sir, uh, your uh, comments on uh, using the heavy silicon oil, sir. Is there a role? Uh, heavy <clears throat> Heavy silicon oil, we don't get it now. That's one issue. Uh, what I do nowadays is to use uh, a PFCL as the tamponade, particularly in GRT patients. So in PFP, you can leave PFCL in place for about uh, two weeks to four weeks and then subsequently replace it with silicon oil or remove it uh, once for all if everything looks good. So I use PFCL as a tamponade, but not in all cases, like for instance, colobomas, you cannot use it because the surface tension of PFC is a little lesser, so there's a possibility it can go under the ICM and cause issues. So in the particularly GRT patients, pediatric GRT patients, or in certain case of Stickler syndrome with GRT, where the PVD induction is not appropriate, you are not able to do a great PVD induction despite all our efforts, in those situations, I would probably use PFC as a top product. Uh, the positioning is a little bit less uh, important with PFCL as compared to the silicon oil. Sir, uh, you know, uh, what... a question to LG, sir, because there's so many take-home points from sir's talk. Can I do that? Yes, yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. Uh, sir, uh, I just wanted uh, that you made a point about the management of the taut ICMs uh, as one of the common causes of recurrence in coloboma RDs. Sir, I just wanted your opinion on the how, what would you do for the taut ICM? And would you recommend uh, excising it? Because there are lot, sometimes large vessels which are bridging those ICMs. So even if you remove the hyaloid, sometimes we see that, that the ICM remains taut. Mm -hmm. So then what should be done? Thank you. Yeah, actually, uh, if you 
see that even if you excise, you can never excise it right up to the coloboma border. You will find that there is still a thin border of ICM represent at the, uh, the coloboma margin, which still exerts traction, if it is exerting traction. So I would, I'm not very, um, I'm not regularly cutting the ICM at all. In the first few cases, what I was doing is the radial cuts to see whether it can relax the TICM. To some extent it can relax, but more importantly is probably to use a little broader barrage in that area. Means if you if you make the chororetinal adhesion, an RPE retinal adhesion, a little broader in the area of the ICM, tot ICM, the likelihood of the tot ICM causing a recurrence because it is lifting up the retina beyond the uh, lasered area becomes much, much less. So if this happens very often when you have patients coming back to you with a recurrence after removal of oil, you'll find that one of these areas of these tot ICM was the cause of the recurrence because the laser was not holding the retina down. So there I use a little broader barrage. That probably works better than trying to excise the ICM. Uh, exercise I assume is probably not the best option. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, so sir, can, can I ask one more question, if uh, it's time permits? Uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, the, many of the coloma are these patients are sir one eyed patient and they do have small eyes and lens which are help early cataract extension. So what is your protocol for management of lens while doing PPV for such cases, sir? Do you do go for lensectomy? I mean, even if the lens is clear, or do you? I try to preserve the lens. It depends upon how small is eye. If it is a relatively normal sized eye, I would not sacrifice the lens unnecessarily, unless it's absolutely required because of other reasons, PVR, peripheral PVR, etc. Then of course you remove the lens. But a routine fresh RD in a coloboma, there is no need to sacrifice the lens. You can do adequate vitrectomy, put a encephalage if you wish to, especially if it is a not a small, not a large coloboma. Large coloboma, which is occupying 40% of the fundus, we don't require even encerclage. Just to be good vitrectomy and do endolaser and put in oil, that should be okay. And I have actually removed the oil and subsequently did a FACO aware when they developed uh, cataract later on in life. So I don't think there's a routine need for removing, sacrificing the lens. But having said that, if it's a small eyeball, say less than eight millimeters uh, diameter cornea, then I would say that the lens is relatively large for that eyeball. And actually, it interests your surgery, and it makes sense to remove the lens so that you can do an adequate vitrectomy. Sir, just uh, uh, I sometimes see uh, patients with having 360 degree barrage laser for prophylactically done in uh, fellow eyes of RD patients. So I I, I just want to hear uh, uh, your uh, inputs on whether it's justified to do that or uh, is it uh, uh, based on PRN if there is any leash. I think doing 360 degree laser is a is a practice in some countries, including some European countries. Routinely, they try to put 360 degrees one, three, three, four rows, and they think that that acts like a artificial aura serrata. But there is no study which has proved that it is successful in preventing a retinal detachment. So I still try to target my treatment to visible lesions rather than doing a 360 degree laser. So it becomes a question of your philosophy rather than what is right or wrong. I don't think we can prove them wrong, just as they can't prove us wrong. So it's just a question of your philosophy. If you think that it works, perhaps it is not too harmful a procedure as long as you stage the treatment rather than putting all the buns in one go. But if you think it is not going to be very useful, then don't do it. I don't do it as a routine. My yeah, I, I, there are a couple of studies, uh, I think in GRT, as well as in stickler syndrome, where they have shown a significant decrease in the risk of uh, uh, detachment in the fellow eye, where they have done about six to eight rows of 360 degree laser. So in those select situations, I think probably you can do not in all regard is, but like there are studies of uh, one eye GRT, the other eye they have done, and uh, if I remember right, in stickler syndrome, sticklers where they have done this 360 degree laser and found it to be. If, like effective, significantly decrease the risk of... So have you done? Because, you know, a couple of patients came to me from Saudi Arabia because this was published from that part of the world. And I was like, you know, if somebody is doing there, please go ahead and do. I have not done, but I want to do. So I wanted to ask, have you done, Dr. Gopal, have you done or anybody uh, else has done? Sickness syndrome is definitely an exception. I, what I was having in my mind when I answered the question was, Routine so yeah. multiple. No, no, I'm just asking, have you done this uh, large areas of laser in the periphery? Should we be doing it? Um, I'm, I'm, I am I'm doing it. Okay, I'm done for Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. I, I am doing it for one eye GRT, other eye stickler syndrome. I do do it. Okay. And if in case I'm concerned about like uh, uh, for like the, uh, the the laser itself causing contraction, I suggest to them a belt buckle as well in addition. Yeah, I have been doing with the buckle uh, before. Uh, I have not done recently, but I think okay, I will also do. <laughs> I, I, think I, you know, I think in select situations it's helpful. I yeah. don't think I would never do it as a universal thing. And we no. did a study in which we compared retrospectively pre-60 degree lasers versus just a laser to the brakes and uh, lesions. And there was no difference in the outcome. This was not a special situations where regular egmatogenous RD where we were doing vitrectomy. No, good. this is what special type of laser which Mahesh is talking about. We also discussed that paper in our general club where it's not just 360 degree laser. They do sort of like we do PRP for ROP. Or if we are that type of laser right from posterior to anterior, that's what they were talking about in that paper. So maybe it works, I don't know, but maybe it will develop some breaks, like you said in ROP. Sometimes we get breaks at the posterior edge of the last laser. You so can still get, you can still get breaks at the yeah. posterior edge of the teeth. Yeah, but maybe it works to if, some extent. If you have seen the McKenzie Free Freeman series uh, for fellow eye uh, with giant retinal tear in the era of even pre vitrectomy. He used to do prophylactic buckle in all eyes with GRT in the fellow eye because he because he believes that that reduces the risk of GRT. But these days, if you find that the GRT management is probably much easier than a RD with PVR management, a fresh GRT management. No, but it's, hence, it's it's not good in children yeah, no, no, and fresh, all like. So I'm not talking about children. I'm talking about yeah. GRT in general. Yeah, GRT. So yeah, a fresh yeah. GRT probably has better success rate in the present era than RD with PVR. So I would say I would not be very aggressive in putting, trying to put a buckle in the fellow eye as a routine. But yes, selected cases, I would do a laser, yes. Thank you. We love to close the discussion. Uh, we go on to our next speaker, Dr. Divya Balakrishnan, who's a senior consultant uh, with retinal services from the Keflar Eye Hospital, Angamani, Kerala. And she's going to talk on recurrent pediatric uh, retinal detachments. So, on to you, Dr. Divya. Good evening, everyone. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Ashreya and Chitra ma'am for uh, giving me this opportunity. And it is a very nice, uh, nice discussions we had so far. And I'll be talking uh, on recurrent pediatric uh, retinal detachment. So already in the previous talk, we have seen what is the difference it from the adults and the risk of recurrence basically because of the varied etiology, which leads to the complex retinal detachment in pediatric population and associated the congenital anomalies like coloboma, morning glory, congenital retinoschisis, uh, and the difference in the vitreous anatomy because of these ad adherent vitreous with vitreoschisis. And the progressive nature of some of these etiologies like FEVR, Coats disease, and many of these cases present uh, late because of the delayed uh, presentation as the children uh, may not complain of any decrease in vision. So they uh, present when the second eye is involved. So many of them present with bilateral presentation with the uh, PVR changes. So the various surgical techniques for managing these uh, cases of regmatogenous retinal detachments, as like in any other RD, we have the options of scleral buckle, pass plan, a vitrectomy, a combination of these. And these days, again, we started talking more about pneumatic retinopexy. So recurrent retinal detachment, we say when uh, the retina was initially attached and uh, it is uh, set as an early re, uh, RD when it happens within six weeks and late beyond six weeks. And in, in with any mode of uh, treatment, there can be a rate of uh, re-recurrence in uh, 10, 10 to 30 percentage of these cases. So what are the uh, causes for causing these uh, rec uh, recurrent retinal detachment? And uh, as we are surgeons, we don't want to see any of our patients land up with this. And LG sir has mentioned in his talk, uh, pre-existing PVR, we can't help it. But PVR, when it ha happens post-surgery, it is mostly iatrogenic or uh, uh, we make it. So we have to be very cautious. And uh, so the next cause is usually retinal break related when the breaks are like large, more than three disc diameters, and it could be because of a missed break or a new break, or when we do buckle surgery, it could be because of the improper positioning or a reopening of the old break or a new macular hole which has developed 
or a reopened macula hole. So how do we manage these cases of recurrent retinal detachment? So it basically depends upon what is the cause for this re-detachment. And when the patient present with the re-detachment, what is the characteristics of the retina while presentation? So uh, what are the most common causes for failure of uh, a retinal detachment after a scleral bucket? So the things would be improper positioning of the buckle under the primary break and inadequate buckle height, or sometimes there could be a progressive vitreous traction mainly in the periphery and formation of new breaks or of the in, uh, insufficient uh, uh, laser or cryo which uh, we have done. So what are the options uh, we have when the patient uh, child presents with a failed scleral bucket? So nowadays, as Sir mentioned, the threshold to convert to a uh, vitrectomy is very low. So most of us would prefer to go for a pass plan, a vitrectomy. But we have other options like a buccal revision or a rescue pneumatic retinopexy. So this was a 10-year-old boy who had presented uh, to us with the complaints of decrease in vision in the right eye. On examination, he was having a retinal detachment and parents noticed uh, this uh, vision loss uh, when uh, some sc school screening program was there. And uh, the left eye had multiple lattices. So I had posted this uh, child for a a scleral buccal surgery, even though there were some anterior PVR and few subretinal bands were there. But while the child was getting posted, he presented in my OPD a week later uh, with a retinal detachment in the left eye. So this was planned for a barrage laser during the surgery for the right eye. So now the plan was to do the left eye first. So I did a buckle for the left eye and the retina got attached. So the child developed cough and yeah, the surgery for the right eye got delayed for more than two months. Still, I thought I would try a scleral buckle, but the buckle failed in that, even though the retina was attached for one week post-op. Present, he presented three weeks later uh, with a recurrence of retinal detachment, and you can see these are peripheral retinal force. So I went ahead and did a vitrectomy, and the retina is attached as of now. So a failed buckle could be because of a proliferation of a PVR. So the options we have is to go inside uh, and do a vitrectomy or maybe um, a revision buckle, which I don't have much of an experience. So the second option we have when the a patient presents later with a, a re-detachment is a, a pneumatic or a rescue a pneumatic retinopexy. So this was a patient who had undergone a buckle surgery, the break is on the buckle, but when the patient presented later, uh, saw that there was a temporal recurrence of retinal detachment and examined carefully there was supratemporal there was a suspected break so a plan for a pneumatic uh, retinopexy so injected gas and then as the fluid resolved supplemented it with a laser so the patient was doing well after the procedure so always you can think in mind which may not we always may not think of such options so pneumatic retinopexy is an option when the patient comes with a recurrence even after a scleral buccal surgery and buccal revision uh, which uh, many of us won't think of in the era of vitrectomy nowadays uh, so the indication is like the scleral buckle is not properly positioned or a buckle height is not high enough or the break is lifted off the buckle or there are new breaks which has developed. So what are the techniques we can do when you do a buckle revision? We can add a scleral buckling material to augment the original buckle or you can modify the existing buckle uh, without adding a new material by adjusting the height or replacing it with another material and also uh, retreat the inadequately closed break or a combination of these techniques. And so these are the options we think of when we have a, a failed scleral buckle. So when we have a, a re-detachment after a vitrectomy, as uh, Sir already mentioned, the PVR is one of the most common co uh, causes. In addition to the uh, described uh, uh, causes in scleral buckle, the silicon oil actually adds one, two more causes like a very silicon oil proliferating membranes. And uh, silicon oil actually needs a, a post-op positioning, which may not be possible in many of these children. And the surgical options we have, if previously we have not done a buckle, we can plan for a belt buckle or a scleral buckle in along with a, a, a repeat surgery with a gas or a silicon oil injection. And while doing that, you have to ensure that if any residual cortex, uh, vitreous cortex is uh, uh, re remaining, you can do a staining with a uh, tri uh, triamcinolone acetonide or a, a trypan blue or a brilliant blue and uh, in some cases we may have to do a relaxing retinotomy but in children that should be this should be kept as a last option 
and uh, so uh, is there any we, we, many a times when we do a vitrectomy we very rarely think nowadays of a scleral buckle or a belt buckle but if the uh, pvr changes are more in the anterior and it causing a foreshortening then always think of uh, supplementing the periphery with a scleral buckle or a belt buckle because this foreshortened retina will prevent the retinal uh, redetachment or else we may have to land up with a uh, retinectomy and in this, when you su support it with a scleral buckle, then the need for a posterior positioning also will be less. So think of encircling a buckle or a scleral buckle when the retina is rigid, when there is an anterior PVR or a high myope with a long axial length or a retinal break, which is not very clear, but the patient present with a ret recurrent retinal detachment or already if the patient has undergone multiple vitrectomies and after silicone oil. Doctor, so, one minute left. Okay. Uh, so these are various, uh, some uh, studies which have published, which have shown that at least for the first recurrence, the re, um, uh, rate of resurgery is less when it is supported with a scleral bucket. And uh, uh, in some cases of recurrence where we have removed the silicone oil or we have done a vitrectomy with a, um, an, um, a gas or something like that, and the patient presents with a superior break or a superior uh, a recurrence, then you can, or even uh, you can think of a pneumatic also. And in some cases, you can think of just a scleral buckle with this uh, uh, addition with a gas. So those options, we rarely think these days, we always think of re-injecting silicone oil. But if you see that the break is in the periphery or the PVR changes are in the periphery, buckle alone is also an option in a post-vitrectomy eyes. So uh, this was a case of a 12-year-old boy who had undergone corneoscleral tear re repair and uh, operated uh, four times uh, elsewhere with the uh, recurrent retinal detachment after a uh, uh, SOR. So... This had actually, I planned for a belt encirclage because the view was very hazy in this case and the peripheral visualization was difficult and the retinal detachment was extending to the periphery with the perif anterior PVR changes. So I went, did a buckle, belt buckle in the encirclage and then removed the peripheral membranes and then uh, settled the uh, retina with a fluid or exchange and silicone oil tamponade was injected. And this patient did well after the surgery and in fact, silicone oil removal was also done later. This was a case of trauma. Uh, again, uh, the uh, retina was incarcerated, did surgery, but this was after three weeks. You can see that the inferior retina is uh, lifted off. And uh, so while doing a re-surgery, always look for any peripheral membranes, remnant vitreous, which is there, and uh, release any traction bands which are there. And all the subretinal mem membranes need not be removed. Or in only those membranes which you feel that it will hinder the reattachment should be removed. And uh, I always try to do staining and do ILM peeling to ensure that all of the vitreous has been removed. So this patient again did well after the surgery. The retina is uh, attached. Uh, it is still under silicone oil. So I am uh, observing this child. So this was a case of morning glory disc. The visual acuity was 1 by 60. Uh, you could see that the inferior retinal detachment. So I planned for a vitrectomy and even, in fact, I did a ILM peeling and a glue injection also in the first go. The patient was doing well the, uh, in the first uh, two weeks. And the third, fourth week when the child presented, again, I could see that there was a nasal and inferior uh, recurrence. So this, I thought like when I do, I wanted to do something to prevent the recurrence because the main scare in this condition is that recurrence and sub uh, uh, retinal silicone oil migration. So this time I was very careful to remove all the glial membranes over the disc and there was superior subretinal migration and there was a membrane posteriorly. So I did not want to make another retinotomy more posterior to remove the membranes. So I just inserted a cannula a little posteriorly and drained the silicone oil bubble externally. So as to ensure that the uh, silicone oil bubble doesn't move around and I can uh, remove it externally. So in the, through the same port, I uh, removed the subretinal membrane, uh, which was there. You can see that it is grasped with the forceps. So, and uh, afterwards, uh, fluid or exchange was done. And uh, I had um, kept a scleral patch graft also in this child uh, over the coloboma, over the uh, disc, so that to prevent uh, hoping that it doesn't uh, recur. So this is something which I don't usually do, but this child was having a recurrence. And in fact, I put a 
uh, silicone oil also afterwards. So this is at uh, three weeks follow up. So I'm still hoping that it remains attached. So recurrent RD, uh, and this was uh, tip actually when I was reading the literature, actually I came across uh, LGSS uh, article and TSS. So this was one tip which I found was that when we plan to remove the resurgery under silicone oil, you do it usually under uh, connected to a silicone oil uh, syringe also. Indeed. But the additional point was that you can uh, uh, remove the fluid and the emulsified oil from the anterior chamber and the interface fluid posteriorly uh, uh, from the retinal surface so as to avoid the um, interface uh, reflex. So there is nothing much we can do much other than our surgical technique to prevent PVR like uh, all these uh, steroids and heparin and 5-fluorouracin have been tried. And preoperative pre steroids when there is a coronal detachment have been found to reduce the coronal detachment but the PVR is not much of a change. So as uh, uh, Sir mentioned, it is the meticulous surgery, use of triamcinolone and wherever possible in uh, pediatric buckle, buckle, buckle. And uh, so to manage, identify the cause and uh, the anatomic success of these three surgeries varies from 65 to 80 percentage. So still, even if you have to do multiple surgeries, sometimes we may be able to achieve a good anatomic success with a fair functional outcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very extensive talk. Ashish, should we have discussions or should we hear the last speaker? Just one question, ma'am, uh, to the panel. Uh, about uh, for in recurrent uh, detachments, uh, uh, what is the role of intravitreal methotrexate? A lot of European people are using uh, repulsor. Nice, uh... I have no experience in methotrexate, frankly. If Mahesh has used it, I'm not sure. Because the problem with uh, recurrences and trying to attribute your success to a particular drug you use is the amount of complexity and multiple reasons why a recurrence act takes place. And we don't know whether your methotrexate has worked, or in that case, it just it would have worked even without methotrexate. We require really a large series, and I'm, I don't have real personal experience in using methotrexate. Dr. Mahesh, do you have experience? Uh, no, sir. I have not used a methotrexate uh, oh. for RD with PVR. Like, sir, always mentions like uh, surgery is the most important, like how meticulous we are. So uh, that is the pattern which I uh, notice in India, uh, literally no one talks about the methotrexate in Europe and Latin America, a lot of people talk about uh, methotrexate. So it's yeah, a point we, have, we have started using methotrexate, just doing a kind of a pilot study, but we haven't really uh, looked at the results as of now. We still need some more time and uh, purely uh, as a pilot study we are doing uh, in uh, recurrent PBRs when we do surgery. So maybe in a couple of months time, we'll be able to tell you whether it really works or doesn't work. Then it's uh, extremely a comprehensive talk. Thank you, Divya ma'am. Thank you. Uh, we go on to our uh, last speaker, Dr. Deeksha, who's an associate professor with your retina and ROP services from PGI Chandigarh. And she's going to talk to us on current concepts in pediatric macular surgeries. On to you, Dr. Deeksha. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, can I share my screen now? Please. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Ashray and Chitra, ma'am, for the opportunity. And uh, without taking uh, much of your time, I'll just straight away go to the topic which has been given to me, which is current concepts and pediatric macular surgeries. And I'll just share uh, my few uh, cases. And I consider myself uh, still a novice in this in the field of pediatric macular surgeries, but. Uh, just sharing my initial experience. Uh, so, <clears throat> so uh, pediatric macular surgery, uh, I would say that offers a unique and interesting set of challenges uh, relative to adult macular surgeries. And the pathology can be fundamentally different than that seen in adults. Uh, for a lot of time, we considered macular surgery in, in children to be basically consisting of management of traumatic macular holes. However, I, I, I think I've just listed out some of the indications where we may have to intervene and it, it, it includes persistent fetal vasculature, like, uh, especially the posterior uh, manifestation of PFV. Uh, we have seen a secondary or coexisting PFV stock with the predominantly macular involvement with retinopathy of prematurity. Presence of epiretinal membranes in cases of familial exudative vitroretinopathy and combined hematomas of the retina and the RPE, and some inflammatory conditions, and particularly parasitic infections such as toxocara, toxoplasma, cysticercosis, 
and optic disc pit with maculopathies. Uh, so I'll just share a few cases. Uh, my first case is that of a female preterm infant who was born at 28 weeks of gestation with a birth weight of 1700 grams and she had uh, neonatal comorbidities and was referred for ROP examination. On examination, the child had uh, esotropia in the left eye. The right eye was completely normal, had a mature retina up to zone 3 and there was no evidence of ROP. This is what the left eye had. Uh, what is not seen in the clinical picture was a thin stalk that was extended from this bunch of the retina that you see over the macula <clears throat> uh, up to the, and uh, its connection to the posterior surface of the lens. So uh, we see that the disc was dragged. Uh, the macula was involved into a fold and was almost like a flower-like appearance. Uh, the lens was absolutely clear and there was no evidence of the anterior um, manifestations or dragged ciliary processes uh, as we see in the anterior, uh, predominantly anterior aspect of uh, PFV. So I uh, gave this child, uh, the, I talked to the parents and uh, they agreed to give a trial for surgery because uh, considering that if we have left it, probably this would have fibrosed and uh, obviously there was a very high risk of amblyopia for this eye. So I did a 27 gauge uh, transconjunctival uh, vitrectomy and uh, the surgery here, I think shows the core principles of any pediatric surgeries that uh, we have to do as little as possible. Uh, we, here I'm doing the core vitrectomy and we saw the stock that was connected to the uh, anterior, the posterior surface of the lens. And I almost always use triamcinolone in all my cases. Uh, and uh, here uh, we I'm using the forceps uh, to nudge this uh, band, this fibrous band, which was connected from the optic disc and up to the area where the stock was connecting. And uh, this is the challenge that we face in uh, pediatric macular surgeries because the hyaloid would be adherent and it will be difficult to induce the uh, posterior vitreous detachment completely. And uh, we'll, we'll have to usually take multiple bites, small steps and uh, keep nudging and tugging. And, or, and uh, at the back of the mind, we always have to be sure that our maneuvers are gentle so that we don't cause much more itrogenic uh, injury and uh, not cause an itrogenic break. Uh, as I said, uh, PVD induction is, is challenging and difficult, but uh, we try to do a limited, at least just beyond the arcades if it is possible, and extend it. Uh, to wherever it is safely possible and then it was closed under air. I, I close under air to allow uh, sutureless closure of the ports and uh, this is the child uh, two months following the lens pairing vitrectomy. We see how nicely the arcades have opened up and uh, the macula also and the foveal contour is better delineated and uh, at the site of attachment we can see a small focal RPE defect. Uh, so this is the second case. This is another preterm infant who was born at 32 weeks at 1600 grams and uh, presented with a zone one aggressive ROP. And we see that this is a bilateral. And in this situation, there was these bilateral secondary PFV stalks leading to a peripapillary tractional retinal detachment predominantly, not a peripheral tractional detachment with the macula getting involved and getting dragged towards the disc and into the folds of the retina <clears throat> in the per peripapillary detachment in and we see these secondary stalks of PFB reaching up to the posterior surface of the lens. So the fluorescein angiogram shows the peripheral avascular retina. And uh, after doing a peripheral laser to the avascular retina, we see that there is progressive organization of this uh, stalk, progressive fibrosis, and these folds have worsened. And in this, we did uh, lens pairing vitrectomy. So this is one eye, and uh, this uh, we could achieve an outcome like this in the other eye. Now, another case of an epiretinal membrane, this was an 11-year-old male uh, who presented with an outward deviation in the left eye for a year and decreased vision in the left eye since six to seven years. There was no history of prematurity. These are the right and the left eye. The right eye visual activity was 6-9, but we can see the supranumerary branching, peripheral avascular retina, and in the avascular retina, we can see areas of lattice and holes. And in the left eye, with a vision of 3 by 60, we can see the arcades narrowed down, a thick epiretinal membrane and the peripheral neovascularization, exudation, which is typical of FEVR. Uh, so in this case, uh, this is the fluorescein angiogram, which shows this neovascular and uh, avascular retina and the neovascular leakage temporally. And this is the left eye fluorescein angiogram. And this is the OCT of the left eye, which, which shows the thick epiretinal membrane. In fact, multiple layers of this epiretinal membrane causing uh, traction on the fovea. Uh, so this case, so 
we managed with the vitrectomy and removal of the epiretinal membrane. <clears throat> Again, after doing the core vitrectomy and instilling the uh, triamcinolone, uh, again, uh, trying to lift the posterior hyaloid as well as the epiretinal membrane with forceps. However, multiple maneuvers may be required. And sometimes it is forceps, sometimes the cutter, the delaminator, and sometimes even bimanual dissection may be required. Uh, these cases, uh, some of these epiretinal membranes may be vascular and they are firmly adherent. And uh, it may not be possible to do a complete uh, uh, to lift up the posterior vitreous uh, up to the periphery, as you can see uh, in this case. And we can clearly see the demarcation of where up to the limit of the posterior vitreous detachment that we could achieve. And beyond that, we have to do a careful shave vitrectomy and, uh, and go all the way. And we have to, of course, treat the peripheral vascular retina. In this case, I did not do the ILM peeling. So uh, I, I welcome suggestions from the panel. Uh, for this case and this is the outcome post uh, uh, following the surgery we see that the uh, arcades uh, have opened up a bit and the, gradually the subretinal fluid uh, will take time it may take some months to go and uh, the fold is also getting better this was another uh, case of a 15 year old female okay, one minute left yeah I'm, i'll wind up this is another fevr uh, case and in this case uh, i'll skip through the initial parts i did put a uh, uh, encirclage and a tire to support the peripheral TRD and uh, uh, again the principles remain the same and in this case uh, after removing uh, the ERM with the forceps and also attempting to do uh, to remove it uh, with bimanual dissection I also performed an uh, ILM peeling and this is just showing that sometimes it is so adherent that uh, we may require multiple instruments and uh, even by manual dissection. So in this case, I did ILM peeling also. And uh, this was the, uh, sorry, uh, it remained okay uh, for about a year. The, the macula, this was how it remained for a year. However, a year later, I had to deal with a rheumatogenous retinal detachment, uh, which I managed with uh, silicon oil. For macular holes, there's this is the list of cases that... Uh, Pediatric uh, ch uh, children may present with macular holes and uh, we have to debate whether observation versus surgery. For most traumatic holes, we do like to wait for at least three months for spontaneous closure, but we have to see the background associated retinopathy and manage that. And uh, this is a case of an inflammatory uh, epiretinal membrane in a case of a toxocara granuloma. And uh, this was also managed with vitrectomy. And we see this, again, a thick epiretinal proliferation and attractional detachment. And this was the outcome after surgery in this case. Vision improved from light perception to right now counting fingers two meters. And the child is still under follow-up. And we may see such kinds of epiretinal proliferations in combined hematomas of the retina and the RP. I won't go into the details. Just come to the conclusion that pediatric macular pathologies can have unique entities with, as compared uh, to adults. We must attempt to find the cause and not rush into surgery. Unlike adult retina surgeries, which can be one and done, pediatric retinal diseases often require multiple surgeries and dozens of office visits over the years. The surgeon needs to plan surgery, anticipating the pediatric anatomy, as has been explained by Dr. LG Sir and previous speakers beautifully. The duration of the symptoms, the progression, the risk of amblyopia are important considerations. However, children are amazingly adaptable. So maximizing even a small amount of vision can change a child's life for the better. And sometimes less is more. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice talk. Well, thank you. Dr. Gopal must be so happy that, you know, you have built so many children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren <laughs> into the field of pediatric retina in India because, you know, we have so many opportunities, so many children, and it's so heartening to see, you know, amazing surgeries and amazing approaches to these, uh, you know, problems. <laughs> it's it's so heartening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gopal, for leading the way. <laughs> I think it's most important to realize that people have learned how to deal with frustration and proceed forward rather than drop and stop operating, which is the greatest contribution that India has made for a pediatric VR surgery. Yeah, I showed one, uh, you know, child cycling last week in APAO. 
uh, to all the panelists because they said we don't operate stage 4b 5 and all then when they saw that they said oh this is really this is stage 5 i said yeah you can see the video and they said oh he's cycling i said yeah they do it's not everybody will do it but it's like pseudomonas endophthalmitis you don't stop operating pseudomonas endophthalmitis <laughs> Oh, thank you very much. It's been a wonderful evening and I'm sure it's going to be wonderful for all those who have watched it. And uh, I wish they can put a comment on how each speaker was just mind-blowing and so terrific. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ashray. Thank you very Thanks much, Chitra. Thank you, you Chitra, for having you. us uh, you know, in this wonderful webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you so you much, ma'am. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ashray. Thank you, Ashray. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. It was thank so you. very nice. Thanks, Chitra, Ashray. I think it was amazing. Yes. Uh, you know, yeah. I just loved it. <laughs> thank, thank you, ma'am. You. All Good your night. presence uh, thank made, Ashray. made this uh, really memorable. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. I think next is we should all get together and publish some of this, you know, as a team, as a group. We have so many amazing cases. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, Good night everyone. Good night. Thank you.